Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we've got an open Q&A. Um, we're going to be talking about House of the Dragon, Rings of Power and uh, other things if you want to really. Um, I just thought we're, we're now just like just over a week away from House of the Dragon. Uh, I'm sure there, there are some burning questions still out there about that. Rings of Power is going to be coming just a couple of weeks afterwards. So less than a month until we have both of these juggernauts of TV shows here. Uh, and there will be so much to talk about when they're live, but um, it's an open Q&A. This could go anywhere. As always, I'm going to be structuring this based upon um, questions I've got from my patrons that I will try and uh, pick up even more than I usually do, try and pick up as many questions as I can from the chat as we are going through. Um, okay, so uh, that's really all I wanted to say by way of an intro. In terms of things going on in the wider world, uh, Sandman, you should definitely watch if you have not. It is excellent. Um, the trailers and interviews and background stuff and basic promotional material for both House of the Dragon and the Rings of Power is coming out now on a daily basis for both of the shows. Uh, so do if, I try on my Twitter to keep up with as much of that as I can and retweet things. So do go and check out all of that. But a lot of the, the trailers we're getting at the moment, we may get another trailer for, I think, say, Rings of Power near at the time. Uh, but a lot of them is sort of uh, regurgitating the same material with a few extra shots each time just to keep us interested. But all good stuff. Um, the uh, the only thing I think other than that that I wanted to say uh, just to start off with is uh, a big thank you because just this last week I reached uh, 400,000 subscribers on this channel, which absolutely blows my mind. And I don't want to give an Oscar speech, but I do just want to say a couple of very quick thank yous. Um, uh, first of all, to my patrons. Uh, patrons, thank you. Um, I say thank you every week because I mean it every week, but sometimes when it hit milestones, uh, your support is what keeps this channel going. So uh, thank you huge, hugely. If, you, uh, if you're not a patron, but you do support this channel in other ways. You watch the videos, you put a like down, you share. Thank you. I appreciate that as well. I know not everyone can be a patron, so um, I don't want anyone to feel excluded. Uh, thank you uh, so much as well. And uh, also moderators. Uh, I want to say a particular, but as it's a live stream, I always thank my moderator because these are the best moderators in the entire world. If you're in the chat, please do um, give them a, a little bit of a show of love as well. Um, and they've uh, they do an amazing job just keeping the the chat a fantastic and open place for everyone to be in um they do as as a sort of a little uh thank you to them when we hit milestones uh, I, I do give them a little uh, treat which if you're if you're a fan of fine music or if you uh, are completely new to this channel and don't really know what's going on I humbly suggest you skip forward for a couple of minutes because uh, what my moderators asked for this time was if I could do a, a brief rendition of a Tom Bombadil song which I'm very happy to do um, uh, and I know that they've been looking forward to this uh, for a little while um, this is the Tom Bombadil Bombadil song, the first we hear of Tom Bombadil. The scene is uh, that the hobbits are trying to escape the Shire through the old forest. Old Man Willow has caught them. They're sort of crying out for help, looking to see who could possibly help them. And then they hear this song coming towards them. And uh, here it goes. Hey doll, merry doll, ring a ding a dillo, ring a dong, hop along, fa la la the willow, tom bom jolly tom, tom bombadillo. Hey come, merry doll, derry doll, my darling, light goes the weather wind and the feathered starling. Down a long underhill, shining in the sunlight, waiting on the doorstep. For the cold sunlight, starlight, there my pretty lady is, river woman's daughter, slender as the willow wand, clearer than the water. Old to Tom Bombadil, water lilies bringing, comes hopping home again, can you hear him singing? Hey, come, merry doll, dairy doll, and merry yo, gold berry, gold berry, merry yellow berry yo. Oh, 
old willow man, you tuck your roots away. Tom's in a hurry now, evening will follow day. Tom's going home again, water lilies bringing. Hey, come, dairy doll, can you hear me singing? And that is for my patrons. So um, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm sure they will already be thinking of what they might want me to uh, to be doing uh, whenever we hit 500k. So um, uh, thank you uh, uh, to uh, to moderators. That one was going out for you. But let's get to um, uh, the business of uh, this live stream, which is an open Q&A, as I say. It's uh, most of the time, actually, I'll just start with this one point or question, actually, for the chat, because I would find this fascinating. I put this to my patrons, open Q&A. The vast majority of the questions I've got from my patrons have been for House of the Dragon. And that, I get the feeling that there is more excitement from a lot of people who watch this channel for House of the Dragon than Rings of Power. I think some of that is uncertainty. We know a lot more about what going to be happening in House of the Dragon and what's going to be happening on Rings of Power. I would love to know, not what, and if you're in the chat, please let me know. Just either put Rings of Power or House of the Dragon. Um, not what you are most excited for, but what, right at this moment, what do you think is going to be, what do you think is going to do best in terms of, uh, I, I don't like this being framed as like a war between the two, but what what do you think is going to be the bigger success? I would I'd be absolutely fascinated to know. Um, just to drop it into the uh, uh, the chat, and I'll uh, I'll just try and get a feel for where as a community we're at. Uh, Marvin Martin uh, saying uh, or asking if dragons are indeed non-binary, could they change gender to match the present rider? Uh, if the first stage is taboo, how did Rings of Power get away with showing the two trees? Um, okay, so a question on each there. Um, the the dragons being non-binary is it's not the way Septon Bath said it, but he's but it does seem to be the case as far as we can tell is that dragons aren't a specific gender. Perhaps they can shift genders. Uh, we don't know. This is one of the things that. Um, where I'm most looking forward to in House of the Dragon is to understand a little bit more about dragon law because in A Song of Ice and Fire, all of the dragon law has been forgotten. Dragons have been gone for 150, nearly 200 years. And so everybody's, when the dragons appear, nobody really knows exactly how do you handle them? How do you get that bond with them? Um, how, how does this whole thing work? So I'm fascinated, and I hope that House of the Dragon might give us a little bit more of this. But the the law, as we have had it handed down to us through Septon Bath, who we're sort of told is a uh, generally a pretty sensible person who knows his stuff. The maesters don't necessarily agree, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Is that yes, dragons could be of either gender and could change gender. So could they change them to match the riders? quite possibly. Um, in terms of Rings of Power showing the two trees, if the first age is taboo, the first age is not taboo. The The rights for um, the Prime Video Amazon have got for um, doing Lord of the Rings stuff, it's complicated. <laughs> um, and when I say it's complicated, I've said before, I, I've asked people who you would expect to know uh wh exactly what the situation is with rights and even they scratch their heads a little bit about exactly who has rights to which thing but what we do know is that they definitely have the rights to the lord of the rings and the hobbit and in the lord of the rings they have the rights to the appendices the appendices for those who don't know these came uh, these are written by tolkien himself he wanted to publish the silmarillion alongside of the lord of the rings the publishers like yeah not so sure about that uh, they had a lot of long um uh, quite friendly discussions via letters you can read the letters um uh, between them uh, but they eventually they came to a sort of uh, a compromise. Tolkien agreed that he would condense all of this extra information he wanted into the appendices that he would he could add to the end of the Return of the King. 
So that's what we've got. What we've got. The appendices are very broadly speaking a condensed version of the Silmarillion. So the first age is not um, uh, out of scope. It's just that it's just the things that are in the appendices that are referred to there. So um, they can and outside of that. The Tolkien estate obviously retains rights and can decide some things if they're allowed to do stuff in order not to go against um, established Tolkien law. Uh, there are some things which technically they might not have the rights to, but they kind of allow them a little bit of wiggle room. Um, Question from uh, so Mr. Marmello, thank you. Just saying uh, hi for singing. I merry. Uh, thank you. Well, and thank you very much to everyone for your uh, nice words about my singing. Um, uh, so uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, just quickly flicking through just to see it when I was asking a little bit earlier about which people think uh, might be the most successful. Uh, just going here, it's House of the Dragon, 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 House of the Dragon. Everybody's saying House of the Dragon, except for one or two. Robert Fletcher saying Rings of Power. Um, but almost everyone is saying House of the Dragon. So, um, yeah, I, I th I th that's definitely the feel I got. I, it would be fascinating to see the feel I got from the fandom. Um it would be fascinating to see how that translates out into sort of the wider world. And I will come back to this because um, that's the feeling I've got going into it is that the hardcore fans, there's so much more confidence in um, House of the Dragon. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. I am, as I've said many times, excited for both. Um, Chase, uh, thank you very much. Uh, with the little super sticker of a fox, um, Freya Firefly saying Rings of the Dragon. Uh, yep. Um, uh, Matt Savino saying, can we get the slow chat on? Uh, yeah, okay. Actually, I might do. If I forgot to do that, I will uh, probably quickly go off and do that. I'll see whether I can keep talking while I'm doing it. Um, um, probably not because I'm one of those people who can't multitask very easily. Uh, okay, here we go. Let's change... Okay, so moderators, slow mode is now on. Um, uh, Mr. Marmello saying five for the rings. Um, thank you. We've got um, cloaked, cloaked 400. You've changed your name. Um, thank you so much. Very kind. Saying, hey, doll, merry doll. Congrats on. 400 more. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Marvin Martin saying, Beren and Luthien are in the Lord of the Rings mentioned by Aragorn. Could that be a loophole to cover that story? Um, yes, the characters, whether the entire story is um, up for grabs is a different matter. As I say, it's, it's very vague and grey. Um, they it's not as simple as saying if a specific thing is not mentioned in the appendices, they're not going to, they're not able to cover it. Uh, but that's the closest line that we've got. Uh, what I know is that they were in constant contact with the, uh, the Tolkien estate all the way through this and asked them permission to do various things uh, just to clarify. And a lot of the time I think they were told yes. So, um, that's not an exact line. Uh, and the other thing to note is that there are various rights out there up for grabs. So do not think that this position is going to stay the same. It could change. So later seasons, they could have more rights to more things. So uh, keep your eyes open on that one. Uh, Mara Lee, hi there, Mara. Um, saying just a uh, show of love, support, and appreciation for all that you do. Looking forward to all the content when both shows are on TV. You are loved and the best. Thank you very much, Mara. You know how much I uh, um, 
we hugely appreciate your your support. Uh, support. Uh, Nerd of the Rings is in the house. Hi there, Matt. Great to uh, great to see you. Um, I'm not even going to address the boxing glove you've got going on there. That's not happening, and you know it. Um, uh, Roman Lakovets uh, saying, "Rumor has it that Aegon the Conqueror invaded Westeros because he knew about the threat from the others." which will be revealed in House of the Dragon. Your thoughts about this idea? Um, yes, yeah, so this is, and I think I've got some questions from my patrons on this, or related to this coming up. But I will, I'll start expanding on this, and then I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to those questions. This is um, something, at the moment, moment we're in the realm of rumours with this, but we do have some things we know about. They're from a very early stage for quite a long time there has been this sort of gap it's not it's not something which has been a huge issue but it's just why was it that the targaryens didn't invade westeros for a hundred years and then suddenly turned around and did um they escaped from um uh, the doom of valyria got themselves onto dragonstone and then stayed there for a hundred years generations passed and then suddenly aegon turned around and decided with his sister wives, let's go and invade. Why? Okay, maybe it was just that was what Aegon wanted to do and the others didn't. Um, but we had before Fire and Blood, the history of the Targaryens came out. George R. R. Martin did a little bit of promotional stuff. He did a promotional video that you can find out there still where he just says... Oh, Almost out of nowhere, he says, Aegon, some speculate that Aegon the Conqueror invaded Westeros because of a, a prophecy, a premonition about needing to unite the Seven Kingdoms against the threat from the others. And everyone was like, ooh. Really, we'd not. This, this is new from George R. R. Martin. And then the book came out, and there was nothing in there about it. It was absolutely not mentioned at all. And it was like, so where was was he just playing with us? That's not beyond George R. R. Martin. He does enjoy this kind of thing. Was he just playing with us? Um, and I can remember being asked about this at the time, and my take was that it didn't seem that based on his actions, what we saw in Fire and Blood, what he did after they invaded, yes, he wanted to unify the Seven Kingdoms, so that would definitely explain that, but the threat from the others? No, that doesn't seem to. He didn't go to the north for ages. I think it was something like 13 years before he went as far as Winterfell. I'm not sure if he even went as far as the Wall. You would have thought if he was there, if his big driving force was to uh, protect the Seven Kingdoms against the threat from north of the Wall, he would have done something about it, but he didn't. So um, I, I wasn't sure about that. It was, still felt a little bit weird. Um, Rumours um, have started resurfacing around House of the Dragon, partly because the main trailer that we had uh, a while ago had this... Um, uh, voiceover from Viserys when he talks about having dreams um, and we know that Targaryens have these kind of dragon dreams, these future dreams, so clearly they're injecting some element of this into House of the Dragon um, we will have to wait and see um, is, my, is the short answer and the bit we will have to wait and see on I think is what this is and where this comes from. Is this just Viserys himself being a dreamer who gets these visions and is that what they're going to be saying in House of the Dragon or is this something which has been handed down from Aegon the Conqueror? Is this just about uniting the Seven Kingdoms or is this specifically about the others? Again, we simply do not have the details at the moment so I think we need to hold judgment on exactly what that is but it, it does, whatever it is, and there certainly seems to be something going on. This does add an extra layer to this story because it means that the Targaryens aren't just here as this conquering race who think that they're better than everyone else. They think they know uh, more than others. They say things like, we're closer to gods than men um, because that they don't come across well being just like that. 
if there is another element where they actually genuinely believe that they have some role in saving humanity, that adds something else to what we've got going on in this story. So I will be fascinated about this. I think uh, we will get some reveals in the TV show, and I will definitely be covering them in some videos when they come out. Um, Freya Firefly saying, fool of a geek. Congrats on 400k. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Nerd of the Rings, Matt, thank you for your congrats as well. Um, Catherine Furseth, uh, thank you. Saying, perhaps easier for the core fans to keep faith in House of the Dragon since George R. R. Martin is alive and involved. Yeah, absolutely. And George R. R. Martin has said he's been very involved in this. He's not a showrunner. He hasn't written any episodes, but he has been very involved. And he, his involvement what he says is to keep uh, keep the the canon canon or keep it uh, right with the canonicity um which is an interesting turn of phrase for him because it's uh, he's implying that what we're going to see is going to be canon um as opposed to just an adaptation that might differ from what's in the books so uh, that's fascinating he has been very involved and this is leaving everything else aside the fact that he's been closely involved has to be reassuring i think uh, particularly as the further away from um uh, game of thrones we have got then the the more he is uh being open about the extent to which he was kept out of the loop in later seasons of Game of Thrones. Um, five and six, he says he was largely out of the loop. Seven to eight, he was almost entirely out of the loop. Uh, so that perhaps explains a lot. Um, Uh, Mattia, thank you very much for the kind words about the singing. Um, uh, yeah, Matt, no other things. I see you're there. You're telling people what you're doing. Watch parties or weekly streams. Um, hopefully we'll have Robert on for an episode of it. Well, uh, I'll happily come on something you do if you come on something that I do. Um, uh, it would be an absolute honor. Um, Alan Simpson, did the earlier Dragon Riders have the same loving relationship with their dragons as Danny has, or was it more of a utilitarian relationship like someone might have with a working animal, e.g. horse? Well, this is the kind of thing I want to find out, and I think they will show us a lot more of in House of the Dragon. But the indications we have is that the bond, whereas uh, Danny has a very specific relationship, she sees herself as mother of dragons, um, and indeed she she fed them with her own uh, milk when they were young. Uh, so she is, and she hatched them herself. So uh, she has this very strong kind of bond. She feels that her own child's death in part paid for the life of these dragons. So her relationship with her dragons is very specific. But what we see in Fire and Blood is a lot of different people who have Targaryens who have these strong relationships with their dragons. And we have hints that um, uh, the relationships between people uh, impact on the relationships between their dragons. So we get there's this beautiful scene um, in Fire and Blood when Jaehaerys I and Alicent's dragons, they they had long died, but uh, when uh, when uh, you see one of them dies, the other one's just kind of like nudging it and come on, wake up. And it's just you feel that there's a bond between those dragons because of the bond that had existed between the dragon riders. So, yes, I think that that does still seem to have been there. Um Uh, Andrew Kay saying, I think it was like three decades for Aegon the First to get north. Uh, was his last progress, I believe, when he went to Winterfell? Yeah, he went to, um, I haven't got the exact dates in front of me, but he went to um, White Harbour a couple of times uh, before he got to Winterfell itself. So, um, yeah, he's definitely... Uh, he, he goes to the north, but he doesn't go to the bit that you would expect him to. If his priority was 
defending the, the, the world against the threat from beyond the wall, you would have thought he would have found some time in the first few decades of his reign to, uh, to get to the, uh, to the far north. Um, Curtis Frank saying, I know that we've discussed canonicity before, but should we treat these possible dragon dreams as special cases as definitely canon? I think I would put personally, and unless we hear anything different from George R. R. Martin, my, my take is that what happens on the TV show is semi-canon. I'm not a huge fan of like dividing up all these things, but um, that they've been clear that some of the decisions that they've made in, in adapting the book to the screen means that um, there will be differences between what we see on the screen and what, what happened in the book. Now, that means that we've got two different versions going on, so something can be canon for the TV show that isn't canon for the book. And I think that's the way I kind of keep it. Um, if there are things that if George R. Martin comes out and says, yes, so this here, that's true for the books, then yeah, I think we take it as such. Uh, Matt Savino saying, what are your thoughts on the Red Keep Godswood Weirwood tree? Do you think it will be burned eventually since no Weir Weirwood is there in Game of Thrones? Yeah, so this was a um, one of the things that we saw in a trailer we saw um i think i think it was very near a leaning against a weirwood tree apparently in king's landing and um there isn't one when you actually read the books uh, in king's landing there is no actual uh weirwood tree there there's a there's a heart tree a sansa and ned go there um i think they take Arya there as well at some point and it's noted that there's not an actual weirwood tree there so what happens, this would make sense if it burns down here. Certainly we get, um, there are plenty of opportunities for that to happen uh, during the Dance of the Dragons. So um, yeah, I think that they might be setting this up. It's not, It's the kind of thing that I'm sure this wasn't just an oversight that they, they assumed there was one there and they hadn't read the books, that the particularly Ryan Condal, the showrunner, is an absolute nerd about the books, so he will know that. I think that, yes, we can assume that this is a setup for that being burned down at some point um, later in the show. Uh, reflective rambling, um, picking up a your question or comment from the pie butty burglar uh thank you i love it when people do this pick up things for other people in the chat could i get a shout out for my cousin ben chud please he's watching and it's his birthday well happy birthday ben i, I hope you are having a wonderful day and uh yeah i hope you're getting spoiled rotten and and spend it in uh, in love with with all of your friends and family so um uh, yeah, have a great day. Uh, Philip, thank you very much, saying, how do you think House of the Dragon will deal with the incest? There's more of it, and it doesn't serve the plot like the Lannisters did. Could get a lot more uncomfortable. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, it will be there. Um, uh, how are they going to treat it? I mean, I think they're just going to treat it in the same way that they did the incesty side in game of thrones it was there it wasn't just the lannisters obviously it was the targaryens and it was just that this is how the targaryens do things um one of the things that um george R. martin's very good at um this was something tolkien was very strong on as well is that he's he's just giving us a story he's not moralizing about it he's not telling us what to think about it he's relying on us to uh respond to it in our own way so i think that um people now accept or understand that that's what the targaryens do so um they probably just won't make a big deal out of it Uh, da, 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 where are we at? Question from Martin S. Uh, this is a Lord of the Rings question. In the Two Towers, Gandalf asked Legolas what he saw before reaching Edras. Why wasn't he given elf quality sight? 
in his Astari form, would he normally be able to see like an elf? So the Astari, when they were sent, the um, they they were sent as old men. The, they took on the form as old men. So Saruman, Radagast, the Blue Wizards, Gandalf. And the reason for that was because their role was not to lead. Their role was not to be the hero that everybody rallies around. Uh, their role was to advise. Their role was to support and encourage and offer advice. And that meant that they had this... Um, uh, physical, uh, not just appearance, but that the, their, their physicality was as an old man. So it was a, a part of who they were, and it was a part of what their mission was that they should have limitations. They weren't just sent there as this great angelic being who could do absolutely anything. They were there to support and help. And that meant that it. this wasn't just the Gandalf show. It was Gandalf helping other people. He... Yes, huge amount, but this this was about Aragorn, this the, being the returning king. This was about Frodo and Sam being the absolute legends and heroes that they are doing their thing. This wasn't Gandalf just charging towards Mordor and the cracks of doom with the ring in his hand saying, I'll do it. The, the, the whole purpose of them was to support and encourage. And that, I think, was why his eyesight was i mean i'm sure it wasn't bad but it was um it was not like super elf eyesight um real jake uh saying will gandalf appear in the rings of power i hope not he shouldn't um gandalf and the estari appear in the third age around the year a thousand in the third age um, the Blue Wizards, Tolkien did shift around a little bit on the Blue Wizards, but my personal plaintext understanding is that the Blue Wizards were there in the Second Age, so we could see the Blue Wizards. But Gandalf should not. Now, the little asterisk here is that um, we've been told that where there are gaps in the narrative and the story and there are a lot of gaps in the second age this wasn't an age that tolkien wrote huge amounts about um then if something is not directly contradictory to what tolkien wrote then theoretically it could be a storyline which is why a lot of what we're going to get in season one of the rings of power is new stories as long as they're not contradictory to what tolkien wrote that's fine would it contradict what Tolkien wrote if Gandalf appeared in the Second Age? You could argue that it never Tolkien never wrote Gandalf did not appear in the Second Age in Middle Earth, um, but I think it would be contrary to the spirit if he did. And I think that they should have the strength of their convictions to go with the Second Age story, not with the the characters that they think people will recognize. I do not think we're going to see Gandalf. I hope we don't see Gandalf. Not that I dislike Gandalf. Gandalf's great. Uh, but I just hope um, we don't. Jonathan Linsell, thank you very much for the super chat. Didn't see a question attached to that, but I'm sure one of my moderators, if you drop it in, if you did have a question, drop it in the chat. Um, oh, I see it here. John, uh, why didn't Rohan or Gondor or the elves attack Sauron when he declared himself in Mordor um, in the late Third Age? The White Council knew it was him um, and at his weakest. Gondor in decent, was in decent shape then. Um, well, it's a good question, uh, but they they might have been in decent shape, but still um, not strong enough to oppose Sauron. Sauron and his forces were um, incredibly strong. Uh, so it, it's... The other thing I think which we kind of overlook is Tolkien does that have longer spans of time than uh, we 
often think of is you think someone declares themselves we live in a fast-paced world these days so the next week perhaps somebody's going to go and challenge them that's not how this worked often centuries go by between someone declaring themselves and somebody responding to that um the elves in particular moved very slowly and the elves were very weak um by that the end of the third age the elves um there was Lothlorien, but that was just the moment they went beyond Lothlorien. Then um, they went beyond the defensive structures that Galadriel had built up there. Rivendell really was just a very small. It was the last home, homely house, the the, the last uh, friendly. It's not a not a great city. This is actually just a smallish place, um, and the uh, the elves of Mirkwood were northern Mirkwood, Thranduil. Uh, they'd been pushed back and back and back and hemmed into their area. The elves weren't really in a position to go attacking anywhere. Uh, ditto the dwarves. Uh, the dwarves uh, that we know they'd only just retaken Erebor in uh, at that time, uh, and a few of them had gone off to try and retake um, a little bit later, it would try and retake Khazad Doom. Uh, Gondor was being harried by um, uh, the. Uh, uh, the Corsairs and, and Harad and places like that. There was This was not a, a peaceful time where everyone could just uh, sit together and make big plans. Um, you you got um, Aragorn, who did go down there when uh, he was Throngil. Um, he did help out a little bit about that, but as a whole, Gondor was not ready. Um Question from Cloaked400, again, picking up for Shmuley Henry. Thank you. Are you concerned there won't be a good versus evil character split in House of the Dragon? No one to love or hate. No Arya, John Tyrion versus Joffrey, Cersei, Ramsay Bolton, etc. Am I concerned? No. Uh, but it's, it's definitely a difference. Game of Thrones had a lot of morally grey characters, but... Even so, there were definitely people that you were rooting for. And the the show made it more so. The, Tyrion in the books, I love reading Tyrion. His, his chapters are my favourite chapters. But he's quite a dark character, really. Yes, he's got his good side and he does a lot of good things, but he's also quite a dark character. Um, similarly, Aya is quite a dark character when you start getting into it. But on the TV show, they definitely made some characters the kind of characters that you wanted to get and support as being the good guys. Um, House of the Dragon, if it is sticking by Fire and Blood, there should be fewer outright goodies and outright baddies. Uh, you might find yourself more siding more with one side than the other side, but ultimately you will look at it and say well nobody here is pure and good and perfect i think we'll probably find a couple who um we have a lot of sympathy for and a few that we really quite dislike um but uh, no i don't think we will get the that sort of clear cut between good and evil characters. Am I worried about it? No, I actually think this is going to be a different type of show. And this is going to be a way of showing it slightly different to Game of Thrones. They want it to feel like Game of Thrones, because obviously Game of Thrones was a massive hit and they want to reassure people that they can do the same kind of thing again. But it will feel a little different and it will feel a little different because it's it's going to be a much the characters are going to be much more uh, gray and multifaceted pretty much all of them um let's go um to a question from I'm sure I had another question here somewhere. Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, Mr. Marmello saying, um, uh, not sure I entirely understand all this. Smog will definitely win the title uh, boxing for uh, 
the rank of the 40k party um not 100 sure of that uh but thank you very much for the super chat cobus uh, jordan jordan saying please read long message would give more if possible well thank you very much uh let me see if i can find the the longer message from you um saying uh, my first live stream on this channel seems awesome by the way oh well done what is your confidence that the new uh, we're well, welcome it's your first live stream and to anyone on your first live stream um get involved with the chat um please do um what is your confidence that the new lord of the Rings series will be good for you would you enjoy it um out of a hundred well so when for me um my confidence i i'm well, what I what I said at the time, I've I've got a slight advantage over most people in that I have seen a bit more of this than most people. Um, I've seen a few uh, about twenty minutes worth of clips. Um, now that, and I've said before, I will say again, that still was not enough to reassure me that uh, about the story the characters these are the uh, these are the things that really drive me what i am sure about are some of the visuals for example so the music is going to be amazing i don't know if you've heard any of the music that, that has been uh, produced so far but it is astonishing the visuals i think casa doom will look amazing i think numenor will look amazing so that i am absolutely confident that there will at the very least be elements of this which i will love um what i can't say yet is the the wider story um the characters because i simply have not seen enough about that um uh, but i i mean what i what i will say to sort of to add to that is i i love i love fantasy i love the world of middle earth and tolkien um there, there may well be things about this that I don't love, but I have a feeling I will enjoy it regardless. I think that it will be, um, it will, it will be the kind of thing that I enjoy, even if there are some things that I think, oh, you know what, that's not very Tolkieny. Even if this turns into something, that I think this isn't, this isn't Tolkien, but this is very expensive, expensive fantasy then I like very expensive fantasy. So I, I'm expecting to enjoy it. I haven't got the confidence yet because I've not seen enough yet, but I am I'm looking forward to it. Uh, username Redacted. Um, this is a House of the Dragon question. Could House Hightower have conspired with the Citadel to poison the dragon eggs? And how does the Iron Bank factor into the dance? Uh, Civil equals dollars uh right a couple of good questions the second one in terms of how the iron bank factors into it the iron bank got a massive deposit uh of a quarter of the money owned by uh the iron throne basically this was the the first and best move that team green made and i hope that they show this um uh, in the tv show because it's very important later on um they decided rather than to keep all of the cash in king's landing because they were in possession of king's landing to start with they would split it up and a quarter of it went to uh old town a quarter of it went to um castley rock a quarter of it stayed in king's landing and a quarter of it they deposited with the iron bank of bravos so the iron bank got uh, a whole load of money to keep hold of for a, a long period of time. So they definitely um, uh, got uh, earned out of it. Could H House Hightower have conspired with the Citadel to poison the dragon eggs? I don't... I, I, House Hightower's involvement, I'm not 100% certain of, but I've talked a few times before. I've done a video on it if you want the full background to this, but the... Dragon eggs, I absolutely believe the dragon eggs were poisoned in the aftermath of the Dance of the Dragons. We're not going to see it in this TV show, I'm pretty sure. The Grandmaster Munken is the most suspicious guy um, anywhere. There is there is a, a six-month period after the end of the Dance of the Dragons when House Targaryen is crippled. We've got... Um, 
Aegon the third on the throne, but he's still only a child, so he's got regents uh, who are ruling for him. Now, we start off with seven regents, and then a whole load of them either die or have to quit or get stitched up over something. Uh, and so they get whittled down. Another three get appointed. They get whittled down. We end up with only one regent, who is Grand Maester Monko. Um, he also happens to, at that time, be Hand of the King. And there happens at that time to be no small council. And at that time, uh, the lords, the great lords of the land, most of them are also children. So there is literally zero oversight on what's happening in King's Landing. And he's obviously the head of the maesters. He's a head of the community, in charge of the communications uh, networks. And we know the maesters aren't, a fan, aren't fans of magic. And when he was asked for, that lasted for six months, maybe even a year, when he was asked about what happened then he didn't want to say about it so suspicious now uh i am absolutely a believer that during that time the maesters poisoned the dragon eggs and um there were still four dragons who survived to the end of the dance of the dragons we will see in fire and blood part two how they die off but um the the dragon eggs themselves after that point all new dragons, if they were, if they hatched at all, were stunted and, and, and deformed and died very quickly. Um, Andrew Kay saying Dance of the Dragons will be more nuanced and complex in terms of those the audience likes and dislikes, filled with grey all over the place. Yeah, absolutely uh, much more erudite than I said. Uh, thank you. Um... Uh, Maura Lee or Mara Lee, thank you very much for the uh, super sticker saying fan. Thank you, um, uh, Sabrina, uh, Sabrina Temi saying, Hey, Robert, if Nettles appears in House of the Dragon in the coming seasons, do you think they can link Nettles to House Valarion somehow? It will work as they are all from Driftmark and have darker skin. A theory, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Nettles, uh, for those who don't know, she is one of the the dragon seeds. She um, tames, bonds with, and rides Sheep Stealer, the dragon, uh, but looks nothing like a Targaryen. Um, and this is... She's got dark skin, uh, curly brown hair. Um, she's not like the classic Targaryen look at all. So um, where where does she come from? Well, it's always a little bit of a mystery in uh, Fire and Blood. But yes, if we're introducing the idea that uh, House Velaryon um, is darker skinned, then that that would make a lot of sense. Um, Grimscape question is too long for super chat. We'll send a second message with the question. Uh, th well, thank you very much. I will see whether I can uh, spot that. Uh, do you think it would work if, as soon as Gandalf found out that Sauron was at Dol Guldur, he abandons the mission to reclaim Erebor and immediately took Bilbo to Mount Doom just in case it was the One Ring? Um, well. Would it work? This is one of those kind of what ifs. Um, the the story requires him not to, uh, because um, the Gandalf has uh, he has a break in the Hobbit. The story of the Hobbit, he disappears for a time because he is doing the raid on Dol Guldur. He knew it was Sauron and Dol Guldur before then, but it's only at that point that he manages. To persuade the White, White Council to come with him and attack Dol Guldur. Um, he did not know that Bilbo's ring was the one ring. Indeed, all the indications are that he thought that this was one of the um, uh, petty rings is the wrong way of saying it, but the earlier power, uh, uh, magic rings that Celebrimbor and co created before the main rings of power, because they did create a lot of prototypes. Um, and Gandalf talks about even the lesser rings have can be dangerous. So he clearly thought it was one of those, because why on earth would the one ring appear um, somewhere underneath the Misty Mountains? It just, it made absolutely no sense. So 
Tolkien wrote it that this was not a thing that would ever happen. If he had realized that it was the One Ring straight away, and he had immediately rushed down there, the it was defended at that point. He might not have declared himself down there, but it was ready and waiting for him. So um, this wasn't exactly... Uh, it wouldn't have been a straightforward thing. And I think Gandalf... Um, the way he works is very much, it's not that he, I will definitely do a video on this at some point, but it's not that he kind of sees the future, but he has a sense of where the future is. And I have a feeling that he kind of knew that it wasn't, that the, the, the mission to destroy the ring wasn't straight away. He had this sense Gollum still had a role to play for good or ill. Um, and quite a few other things that he just had this kind of sense about. So, I don't think it wouldn't have been as, as straightforward as that. It wasn't completely unoccupied. And that wasn't where um, that wasn't where Tolkien wanted the story to go. Uh, Dotan, uh, thank you very much, saying just wanted to say thanks. Usually I am a purist, but you really helped me accept the necessary changes due to social needs or technical alike and enjoy. I'm a character person and your outlook. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, it's um, I'm I think we just enjoy what we've got in front of her um, in front of us when we get uh, something which is delivered, uh, which is will be different every adaptation is different to the source material um and i think we just have to accept this is a different thing and hopefully it's going to honor the original but it's not going to be exactly the same uh viking it good to see you there in the chat um a uh, trig uh saying i quite like what dick francis of all people said uh great writer uh, good people are more interesting than bad people because it takes more effort to be good. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting quote. Actually, I've not really thought about that. Um, I think uh, the way uh, George R. R. Martin often talks about it is the only thing, and this isn't, wasn't him originally, it was someone like Ernest, Ernest Hemingway, but there'll be someone in the chat who will be able to tell me where this came from originally, is that the only thing worth writing about is a heart in conflict with itself. That, I think, is the is, is, a, is also a really insightful thing because it's, um, it's when you want conflicting things. And, and this is why good characters perhaps can be so fascinating because part of them doesn't want to do that. It's an effort to do to be good and the easier path is often not to be good uh, martin s are you familiar with the book series memory sorrow and thorn by tad williams inspiration for george R. R. martin as i understand it world building somewhere between tolkien and george R. R. martin i'd say yes i am familiar i've read the it was a few years ago now that i read them uh mm. but they are good tad williams is an excellent writer if you ever um get a chance he wrote also what was it called other land i think it was which is also excellent um but yeah memory sorrow and thorn i know quite a few people who've said this is one of the um uh, you can see a lot of clear influences there um and i i often highlight robin hobbs series um the uh the farseer series which has a lot of very very strong uh, links across Tad Williams isn't one of the people that George R. R. Martin often highlights. He, he more often, he talks about Tolkien all the time. Literally every interview he mentioned Tolkien um, as an influence, but there are a lot of other people that he, he mentions. Uh, Tad Williams, I would put there as an influence, but um, I'd be wary of uh, saying, sort of trying to draw too strong a line there. That said, I've not read it for a long time, so maybe if I go back to it, I will see um, uh, see some uh, some stronger links. Yeah, it, do drop into the chat if there if there are some very obvious links across. Do let me know. I find that fascinating. As I say, it's been a while since I read them. Um, Clicked one. Uh, thank you very much. Saying picking uh, this is picking up for Tyler uh, Pretty Arrington. My question is, why do you think Damon wants the throne? Based on Fire and Blood, he doesn't seem to try taking the throne. Um, and when Rhaenyra is queen, he doesn't stay in King's Landing to rule. 
Um, so why do I think he wants the throne? Um, because, I mean, I don't think he necessarily wants the throne, but the, how he gets the most power is the um, sort of the cheat sheet for him. He very clearly thought that he was the heir to start with. And when it became apparent that he wasn't, he very clearly was trying to find ways to get as close to being in the center of power as he could. When he embarked on his campaign to the Stepstones, he could have just destroyed the 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 other guys who were there, the, the um, I'll talk a little bit more about that because I've got a question about it. Um, but he could have just done the Stepstones campaign and that was it. Um, and said, these are now uh, owned by the Iron Throne. He doesn't. He gets himself declared king of the Stepstones. He clearly wants power at, or the recognition of his role and place. So... Um, my general take is that at first he thought that he was the heir, then eventually he had to accept the fact that he wasn't anymore. He was a lot lower down the um, the, the list of um, heirs, particularly once uh, Alicent and Viserys had had some sons. Uh, he moved a lot, a lot uh, further down uh, the line. Um, so I think he accepted the fact that he wasn't then the the next in line. But he thought, how can I get myself back into favour? And that, I think, is at least part of why he married uh, Rhaenyra. Uh, I think there was a connection between them. But trying to get close to power, all of what he's about is getting uh, power. And, I mean, what Matt Smith says is that he's basically there just to cause chaos. I think there is that element to him as well. Um, Dr. Oak saying, do you think we'll explore lands further afield in the Rings of Power? Harad Umbar, uh, Kand, we definitely will be traveling further than we have done before. Uh, so we'll be going to Linden, which is further to the west than we have done before. We'll be traveling to Numenor, uh, which is uh, off into the ocean. Um, and we'll be traveling to uh, at least one of the settings is down near Harad, they're calling it. So it's the lands bordering Mordor, uh, sort of to the south and east. So we will be going further afield. Uh, and hopefully we'll be going even further afield in future seasons. Emma uh, Sharman saying he doesn't actually like statesmanship. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. So he likes power, but he doesn't want the day-to-day -day business. This is Damon Targaryen, the day-to-day -day business of actually ruling. That's not him. Um, okay, let's go to... Um, uh, actually, I've just Damon Targ in the chat saying Matt Smith said there was a lot of discussion uh, before they started with the showrunners on whether Damon wants the throne for himself. And in the end, it's that he doesn't. Oh, interesting. I'd, I'd not heard. Um, uh, I'd not heard that from uh, Matt Smith. Uh, but yeah, it's it's. He initially thought that he was the heir. Um, that much is clear to me. But um Later on, it's the power. He definitely wants the power. Um, let's go to some questions from my patrons. Ruven Derenda saying, hello, Robert. Hi. Uh, how much do you believe we will see of the different sources from Fire and Blood in House of the Dragon? Mushroom didn't appear in the first episode, uh, and it's likely that he might not appear at all. But what about the other sources? And is there still a chance of Mushroom running around in the background yes yeah, so um we've not seen it yet but we've heard nothing about mushroom um which is very disappointing for those who are unaware house of the um fire and blood had a number of it was written by a maester and the maester relied on a number of different sources the the key ones we have we've got three maesters uh Runciter, melos and orwile a source that he relies on and mushroom who is this court fool uh, and a dwarf who he also relies on though constantly says how uh, we probably shouldn't put too much weight on what mushroom says but mushroom stories are always the best ones now are we expecting to see these characters we will definitely i think see all while 
Um, we will definitely, I think, see Septon Eustace. Mushroom, though, we've not heard anything about in terms of casting. I do wonder whether if they're going for this kind of dark, brooding atmosphere, uh, layered characters, um, grey characters, do they really want this court fool who's capering about? Uh, would that not just be the equivalent of having a Tom Bombadil just suddenly thrown in there, a little bit jarring? I think um, we're not going down the Tom Bombadil route again, though. Um, I think, though, they might decide not to. I, it's a shame. I would hope that they will include him in the background, but just not having him as a major character. And he shouldn't be a major character, because even Mushroom, although he does claim involvement in some elements of the story, uh, he he's, doesn't claim that he is the centerpiece of this. So I, I've, got not, I've got no problem with him not being a main character. I would like to see him somewhere in the background. I do wonder, though, whether it might not be in season one. It might be later on. Once they've established the show, they can then start enjoying it a little bit, perhaps. Um, Sam Day uh, saying, building off of that question, do you think we will be, will be given multiple options for different versions of events from different sources or one George R. R. Martin approved version? What are some events that could be seriously different depending on what source they go with, uh, e.g. Uh, Rhaenyra rejecting Kristen Cole or vice versa? Um, well, we've got, and I would recommend have a look for Game of Owns, who did an interview, a podcast they did an interview with George R. R. Martin, and actually can just come into my mind, um, good friends of the channel, History of Westeros, Aziz and Ashaya, they have got secured themselves an interview with George R. R. Martin, so, uh, and that's coming up literally in the next um, uh, week or so. If you have a question for George R. R. Martin, go and put it to Aziz and Ashaya, that that would be amazing. Um, but um, going back to uh, the, the Game of Thr Game of Owns interview, he talked about this quite a lot, and he talked about the fact that they had these discussions. He, George R. Martin was very involved, particularly in the early days when they were talking through how to handle this, and um, the, he, he said they did talk for quite a while about the idea of having different versions, of showing different versions of this, or having um, uh, having a maester sort of being this uh, the, the the person who's sort of telling the story, and then we sort of go into it um, uh, as the style of Fire and Blood. But they decided not to. They decided they would just go with one narrative all the way through this. Uh, so we're not going to get conflicting storylines. We're not going to get conflicting accounts. And so all of those points in Fire and Blood where um, we get the the narrator sort of take, takes a step back and says, well, we don't know what happened. It could have been this or it could have been that or it could have been the other thing. All of those things, I mean, some of them they might just kind of draw the curtain and let it leave it to our imagination but for most of those things they have made a decision now George R. R. Martin has teased that on some of them they went with things that weren't even some of the suggestions that he came up with in Fire and Blood so do not expect everything to be just limited to what is in Fire and Blood if they if they found a better way in their minds they will have gone with that so we're not going to have lots of different versions. We're going to have a single version. Uh, we've talked about canonicity a little bit earlier in the stream, so I'm not going to go back into that too much. Um, and it's not 100% clear whether this is GRRM approved or this is GRRM said, uh, I'm not. I'm not saying no to that, uh, which is a subtle difference, but I think it's uh, it's probably quite an important one. Uh, Kaius Ballerina, um, uh, picking up a question, thank you very much, for Emma Scheiman. Could any of the Dayfly kings have been good rulers if Aegon II hadn't returned? Um, 
Yes, so there was um, this moon of the three kings, and they, uh, after um, Rhaenyra gets run out of King's Landing, basically you get, there are three hills in King's Landing, and on each of these hills somebody else, somebody, a different person was basically acting as king, um, and these some some people call these the dayfly kings because they sort of like appeared and disappeared uh, there are a couple of other examples of this who just like appear and disappear appear. this isn't just a simple matter of was was it the greens and all the blacks in control by the end no one was in control what george R. R. martin does in fire and blood uh, quite strongly i think is show that some of those people actually had really quite sensible policies um, uh, when you read through what they're suggesting and the maesters laugh at them and say well this is ridiculous all of these ideas that they're coming out with but actually quite a lot of them to us seem quite sensible so um, could any of them I don't think any of them would have been able to hold control of uh, King's Landing for any significant period of time so that kind of rules them out as long term rulers uh, but in terms of sort of ideas people and uh, uh if we're talking about who we might ideally want to rule then yeah i think probably a few of them uh would have done a better job than quite a few of the targaryens did um george R. R. tolkien saying salutations robert i hope you're having a great week so far i am and i hope the rest only gets better thank you i was wondering if you got to watch the sixth season of peaky blinders amazing series i have not um uh, but i'm i'm really behind on all of my my viewing there are three great shows that i i'm desperate to uh, to binge my way through but i know i've got quite a busy time coming up peaky blinders is amazing uh, you've probably heard it from people before but it is really really good i'm about three seasons into that at the moment um westworld i'm a couple of seasons behind on that but this season has been great um it's quite stripped back it's not as overly layered and complex but it's still got the same high high quality of of acting and storyline and uh interplay between the different strands of what's going on and it makes you think um and sandman uh if you're a fan of uh, the the graphic novels the graphic uh series then uh, that this does it justice i i've only watched the first couple of episodes but it it does look amazing it feels amazing it it's really good um so i would highly recommend uh sandman on netflix which seems to have been a massive success as far as i can tell it seems to be number one in most countries of the world as far as i can see um but uh george R. R. tolkien you are also saying uh house of the dragon question i was wondering if you know what we will see as far as the crab feeder character goes i know how he dies but i was recently listening to the audible of fire and blood and i still don't understand what was going on with his whole plot line and the three sisters if you could clear that up for me, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, well, yeah, absolutely I can. So this is a guy called Kragas Draha, Crab Feeder. Now, what I will do, let's see whether I can um, uh, try and do a clever thing. Here we go. Look at this. So this is a map, and I brought this map up. This is from Quartermaster.info, um, if you want it, which is a fantastic interactive map of uh, Westeros and Essos. I brought this up because this is, it, it feels like a slightly weird tangent to the main storyline, but it's actually, it shows how George R. R. Martin's world building operates and how he uses things happening in different parts of the world to impact on the main storyline that we're talking about. This is about the three sisters, the triarchy. And to understand it, we kind of reel our way back a long time, uh, so a couple of hundred years or so. We have the Doom of Valyria, uh, before which the Targaryens have escaped to Dragonstone, which uh, is obviously the island there, just um, uh, off of Westeros. Um, but in the absence of the Valyrian freehold, suddenly... Essos is free from the Valyrians and what do they do we get the nine free cities that we know about 
uh, vying for power. Volantis is one of the most powerful right down there at the bottom um, of the map, the bottom right of the map. And they are trying, they tried to re or to establish themselves as the, the successor to Valyria. And they tried to take over the other free cities and basically make uh, Volantis be the, the new Valyria. They failed eventually. They did quite well for a while, but they failed eventually. And one of the the final things in that long-standing war that happened was they got pushed out of the disputed lands. The disputed lands, if you look at the bottom left of Essos, um, that whole area there, uh, the sort of the sandy brown area, that's the disputed lands. It's called the disputed lands for the obvious reasons that ownership of it is disputed. And the three cities around the outside of that, uh, Tyrosh, Mir and Lys, they, those three are the, the three cities that dispute it. They, having had a game of divide and conquer played against them by Volantis, they came together and pushed Volantis out. So that's the situation we have a little bit before the Dance of the Dragons. And they, for, as a, as a one-off, this lasted only a few years, uh, they formed the Triarchy, the Three Sisters. The three cities, instead of fighting each other and these endless battles with all these sellsword companies, they get together and they form this council. And they go, well, what next? they decide to invade the Stepstones. Now, the Stepstones, if you see that load of small islands, which is going between the Disputed Lands and down to the end of Dawn, this is the Broken Arm of Dawn. Um, this is hundreds, thousands of small islands. And historically, this has been a place where smugglers and slavers and uh, ne'er-do-wells of all kinds hide out on one of the islands and if a... If a merchant ship goes through, then maybe the pirates will try and attack it, um, or maybe someone will uh, go in and, and claim some slaves from the ships. That kind of thing. These are dangerous waters, and the disputed land, the uh, the triarchy decide they will just take over um, this land, and so they invade the Stepstones. They take over the Stepstones. This is a long campaign. It takes a while. It's led by this guy called Crabfeeder, who got his nickname because he would, rather gruesomely, enemies that survived battles, he would just peg them out onto the shore and wait for the, the sea to rise and take their bodies and feed to the crabs. So he was a gruesome but effective military leader. And what happened was that they got they won the stepstones and to start with the reception in westeros was great the pirates have gone there's no need to to worry about uh, the trade route because that is the main route between anywhere king's landing uh, gull town white harbor anywhere on that side if they want to get around the bottom of westeros across to the free cities uh, to the sort of the south of essos they had to go through the stepstones and now it was a whole lot safer but crab feeder started charging a small fee and to start with this was okay uh, westerosi nobles were fine okay we'll pay a small fee because we we don't have any pirates to deal with anymore and it's okay. But then that small fee got bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually it just seemed to be a huge problem because there wasn't pirates there anymore, but it was just making business impossible. And this was a big problem, particularly for Corlys Velaryon, who, as we know, was this great seafarer so he and his ships would want to be going through there a huge amount of the time their trade would be wanting to go there a huge amount of the time and this was costing him a lot and it was an absolute aggravation so he wanted to do something about this daemon targaryen at the time he'd been banished from court he was angry moody wanted to take it out on someone he joined forces with Corlys Velaryon and they just attacked the Stepstones and they pushed Crabfeeder out. They got all but two of the islands. 
and they killed him. And that was when uh, Damon got himself crowned the King of the Stepstones. So that was what that was about. This was um, a, a big setup which allowed us to see Corlys Velaryon and Damon Targaryen coming to some kind of alliance. They understood each other. They had a shared outcome that they were trying to achieve. That wasn't the end of it, though. Uh, the war carried on for quite some time, um, but uh, it was uh, the the triarchy then became enemies of uh, the uh, the Valarions because they'd been pushed out from uh, the stepstones that they considered their own. So that's the whole story then, and that plays into what happens with the Dance of the Dragons, because then the, the Greens, Otto Hightower, can write to them, ask for them to support him. So that's the uh, that's the, the whole situation. There. And as I say, it's this is George R. R. Martin doing his, his complex interlayered politics on this. Um, uh, okay, so I hope that all... Uh, made uh, a little bit of uh, sense um just try and catch up on some questions in the chat as we go uh by martin s um talking this is rings of power stuff again or um uh, Lord of the Rings. What kind of powers do you think the Witch King actually has? Do you believe Sauron temporarily pumped him up, as it were, when attacking Minas Tirith? Is his power greater, closer to Mordor? So he had a lot of powers. He was he was a necromancer. He had um, uh, powers of the Black Breath. He could sort of knock out foes. Um, um, he had great fear, uh, sort of a fear aura wherever he went. People got scared, um, and uh, obviously he was indomitable. Uh, you couldn't kill him unless you happened to be um, a woman or a hobbit. Uh, but uh, yes, he had a whole load of powers. We are told that before sending him out to attack Minas Tirith. Um, Tolkien in one of his letters said and I can't remember the exact phrase but it was something like um, he filled him with greater demonic power as he sent him out so yes he did he pumped him up um, was his power greater closer to Mordor we're not I don't think Tolkien says that explicitly but um, uh, his power partly was from himself, and it was partly came from Sauron. Um, cloaked one um, for Renan. What do you? This is going to Rings of Power. What do you think about the theories that Meteor Man might be Tillian the Meyer, the man in the moon in Hobbit legend, as opposed to him being a blue wizard or some other Meyer? Okay, so Meteor Man um, is the name that the we've given uh, as a fan community uh, to this character who appears in the trailers, the, the, the meteor, the comet heading across the sky and everyone's like, oh, the skies are strange. And it crashes into the ground uh, near the Harfoots and they go there, they discover this man in there. Um, and who he is is definitely going to be one of the big mysteries of this season. They're, they're keeping this very close to their chest. We, they've not shown us much of that storyline in the in the trailers, it has to be said, but they are keeping it uh, quite a secret. So who might he be? Well, um, him being a Maya is quite a good shout because... He's clearly just not a normal human being. He's not a dwarf. He's not a, an elf. He's just not c coming down from the heavens in, in a comet and then uh, it breaking open and you crawling out. That's not that's not normal. That's, that's a, a superior, that's a powerful being doing that. But this, the meteor man appears from what we can see to not 
necessarily know exactly who he is or what's going on. He's not there, as far as we can tell, immediately turn into it, turning into some being of power. He looks like an old man, which again makes us think of the Astari, so Maya. So could he be um, uh, Tillian the Maya, the man in the moon in Hobbit legend, as opposed to a blue wizard um, or some other Maya? I'm... I'm generally of the opinion he's probably not a blue wizard because the blue wizards come as a pair. Um, and this is generally seen as a an omen, a bad omen. Uh, could he be another Maya? I think that is looking the most likely solution at the moment. Uh, Ubermelon, uh, Varys's little bird. Um, he learns of uh, Catelyn coming to King's Landing before she arrives. I think he is a warg of some kind, seeing through their eyes. Are they mute because they are warged into? Hodor is almost mute, uh, as is the dusky woman. Um, okay, so uh, this is obviously Game of Thrones question. So the dusky... There's a few different things going on there. Hodor is is a, almost a mute. He obviously isn't a mute. He can speak, but he can just say the one word. And although it won't be exactly the same in the books as on the show, George R. R. Martin has confirmed that it's like that. Uh, this is about Hodor, hold the door. This is about him in some way being affected in his youth in some kind of a closed time loop. We don't know the detail yet, but that was what's going on there. So that Hodor is a special case. The Dusky Woman is a book-only character, so if you don't know who that is, don't worry. This is someone who Euron sends with Victarion over to Marine on the boat as a gift, and her tongue has been cut out, so she is mute. Now, I think, I've not done a video on this anywhere, but I think it's reasonably obvious that this is Euron's spy, that he does walk into her in some way and see through her eyes so he knows what is happening with Victarion. That makes sense to me. Um, so I think that is a specific thing that is happening there. In terms of Varys, him uh, arriving, uh, so his little bird's, he, we, we meet his little birds. They are his, his spy network of children whose tongues are cut out. Um, but the, the fact that he knows that Catelyn has arrived actually is, um, is it sort of explained in the plot? It's like the, the clear implication is that Cat, Catelyn says, how did you know? And she said, but I paid off the, um, uh, the captain of the ship, and and basically Varys is there saying, well, yeah, but you know, other people can pay him as well. And then there's the innkeep here, and then there's people looking out on the docks. This is not a surprise. I don't think there's a mystery here, personally. I don't think there's a mystery here to how Varys knew that she arrived. I I think his the the language is is interesting. I I would agree, but I personally don't think that Varys is is magical in any way. Callie Summers, um, who, thank you very much, saying, who was the Three-Eyed Raven before Brynden? A Stark? Did they set up the Stark winnowing that led to the She-Wolves arc? It also led to Jon Snow. So um, this is, I mean, the Three-Eyed Raven and the Three-Eyed Crow is, is a language difference between the show and the books. So the Three-Eyed Raven is a show thing the three-eyed crow is the book thing now on the show it did sound like it was a job title um i am the three-eyed raven in the books it appears very clearly that this isn't it is in fact just um effectively blood raven's avatar what I mean by that is um, there is in Green Dreams, then you appear as something. You appear as a, a representation of you in some way. For example, 
Benjen is sent to Winterfell to find uh, the winged wolf that has been chained down. Now, he gets to Winterfell and decides that that is Bran. But they didn't know who that was. He didn't say he didn't go there thinking you must find Bran, his uh, his avatar in this in the the green dream world is is a winged wolf tied down uh, with chains. Um, he went there and tried to figure out who it is, who this might be, and that's the same thing with the three eyed crow. Is the three eyed crow appears to Bran in his dream? It's it's Blood Raven but he appears as a three-eyed crow. And so that's why when you get Bran gets to Bloodraven and he says, are you the three-eyed crow? And he goes, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. Um, because it's not that he, that's his, that, that's not his job title. That's not his name, but that's how he appears. And that's because that's a representation of who he is. Uh, a thousand eyes and one, so he's got the third eye, the crow, because he was uh, Night's Watch, and uh, and so on. So that is what seems to be going on there. That background is leading up to the point that there, because it's not a job title, there wasn't a previous three-eyed crow in the books. Uh, there were plenty of other green seers who were children of the forest who were connected up. Uh, Bran sees them when he's wandering around as uh, as Hodor through the caves, um, but there wasn't like a previous human who was the the three eyed crow or raven. Um, think that's me caught up on the chat. Maybe one more username redacted saying Mordor, uh, a naturally evil place, or was it corrupted? Um, the I mean, it's a good question. It's I think we might get something about this in the show. <laughs> um, is is probably the, the sort of the answer. He Sauron makes it his base in the second age he has Barador built there it takes 600 years to build the the fortress of Barador uh, Barador uh, but before that that wasn't his base it wasn't the base of uh, Morgoth his boss effectively back in the first age the bigger baddie um, that wasn't his home base but we are told that to the east and south uh, then the humans fell under the shadow. So uh, Sauron, um, his presence there, as it appears to have been there for quite a bit in the early Second Age, does seem to have led a lot of um, uh, the humans there to sort of fall under the shadow. And even way back in time, those further east, both Elves and humans more easily fell under the shadow than those who headed west towards the light. So is it a naturally evil place? No, uh, it was where Sauron decided to set up base, but there are reasons why he set it up there. I mean, and one of them is pure geography uh, as well. Um, cloaked 400k saying uh, chase... Uh, in Deep Geek Con in Helsinki for 1 million subscribers. Uh, I've never been to Helsinki. I'm sure it's a wonderful place. Um, uh, a million subscribers feels a very long way away, though. So uh, um, I'm not going to throw away a yes at this point, but uh, uh, Helsinki sounds lovely. Um, question, Clint 400k again, thank you very much. Picking up Svergen Silber. A question. Just recently discovered your channel after I started reading A Song of Ice and Fire. Absolutely love your videos, especially the Lord of the Rings ones. Have you ever written or considered writing your own stories? Well, thank you for asking. Um, it, it, I do get asked this a lot. I'm At some point, I'm sure I will. Um, I, I love writing because I write the scripts for my videos. Um, so um, it's a thing I enjoy doing. Uh, so uh, maybe in the future, yeah, I will... I will try my hand, but uh, not not for the not in the near future. But 
um, yes, thank you. I, it, it's definitely something on on my radar as something I'd like to do at some point. I think everyone's got a novel in them, haven't they? Um, Cole Kosnock uh, pointing out simul streaming on Twitch. Yes, I always forget to say this. If if you're watching this on YouTube, but you actually find it easier to watch things on Twitch, I'm simul streaming on Twitch. I'm paying attention to the chat here rather than the chat on Twitch, but hello if you're on Twitch. Uh, good to see you. Um, uh, so uh, if you find it easier to watch on Twitch, then please uh, do go and check that out. Um, and Reflective Rambling, I just saw your uh, name, which reminded me of your reminder to me when I was talking about Sandman, I should have advertised my second channel, which is The Well Told Tale, which is where I uh, read audiobooks and the um, the story of The Sandman by E.T.A. Hoffman, which is not the same as the Neil Gaiman story, is up there if you're, if you're interested, as well as many other stories. I think the last one I've got on the YouTube uh, page, which is a little bit behind the podcast, um, I think the last one I've got there is um, Shadow, Shadow Over Innsmouth, which is a fantastic um, H.P. Lovecraft story. It's fully in the Cthulhu mythos. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, please do go and check that out. Um, right, is that me caught? I think that's me caught up in the chat. Let's go to a couple more questions from my patrons. Uh, Chase, um, oh, I was just talking to you about you a moment ago, uh, saying, hey, Robert, back as a patron after a while, super excited, welcome back. Uh, absolutely shiny tinfoil coming up. The reason Otto Hightower was so bitter and angry towards Damon was because he was a spurned lover. Instead of Alicent, Damon slept with him, but he loved and left as Damon does, causing the bitterness. Um, works also as a foil, get it tinfoil, to Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole, who also became enemies uh yeah i love it i don't think that's i don't think that's what was going on um but uh i do i i, I love other ways that things could have happened uh it works uh, really well um and i mean i think the most likely thing that this is a slight digression off of this but uh Otto Hightower, and I, I hope, I think we will see it in the TV show, definitely in, when you read Fire and Blood, Otto Hightower hates Damon Targaryen, absolutely loathes him, and it comes across as more than just a, I don't think this is the right person to be close to the throne. It comes across as something deeply personal, and it feels like something triggered that. My my own personal get, best guess is that maybe his first idea was, hey, I could uh, perhaps I could match up Alicent with him. He does seem to be very much want himself wanting to be in the center of power, um, and either Damon um, said no, or perhaps as was hinted in in Fire and Blood, uh, maybe they got together and then. Uh, he went away, um, and that is why Otto Hightower was so angry with him. There's definitely something there that wasn't fully explored in the books, but maybe we'll, it will be on the show. Uh, as a serious question, based on the trailers and clips we've gotten so far, what scene are you most excited about House Dragon? Um, well, the thing with Damon should be fascinating. I think the scene that I really... I don't think it's going to be a season one. Uh, Blood and Cheese will be astonishing when we get to that. Um, and also later on when we get the Battle Above the God's Eye, that will be amazing. Um, in season one, I think for the sheer drama of it, I think the, the when Amond claims Vagar and then you get the fight with the strong boys, uh, the eye being cut... Uh, the confrontation that follows that, that will be, that's when things really boil over. And I think that the the tensions that were there will come to the fore. And I, I'm really looking forward to that as, as a scene. Uh, Christomir Rakov saying, Westworld, question mark. Um, loving Westworld. If you're asking if I'm covering it this time, I'm not covering it this time around. Purely in, 
in time. I simply have not had time this uh, this time around to do it. I refer you to Hacks Dogma, who does the best coverage of Westworld. He uh, collaborated with me all the way through the last season of Westworld. Um, so um, do go and check out Hacks Dogma for breakdowns, theories, and all of your Westworld needs. Chaos Ballerina um, saying, is uh, Damon's black armor Valyrian steel? Uh, does it become Rhaegar's? Um, so uh, the black armor, he, he's in black armor. Is it Valyrian steel? Almost certainly not, because we we would have heard about that, I'm sure, in Fur and Blood if he had Valyrian steel armor, because Valyrian steel is so rare. Um, does it become Rhaegar's? They've certainly very much echoed his uh, armor from some of the, I think, Mark Simonetti's uh, drawings of Rhaegar, the Battle of the Trident, uh, the armor, the black armor, the wings, the ruby studded breastplate, that all is very much echoing it. So they've taken the visual style. I don't think that we will see that this was the exact same suit of armor because uh, when you're that rich and privileged as the Targaryens are, then you get your armor made for you personally, um, made to measure. Um, Cloaked 400k picking up for Tasneem Akbar, uh, saying, I've noticed that Galadriel, Rings of Power, is wearing the Star of the House of Feanor in the Rings of uh, Power trailer. Why would she wear a symbol of a house that she loathes? Is there something that I'm missing? Um, no, uh, there isn't. The, the, the this, this has, uh, I'm, I'm in various, just sort of pulling the curtain back a little bit there, there I'm in various sort of, uh, chat groups with sort of other sort of Tolkien content creators and the like, people who are very knowledgeable. This is one of the things that people have talked about a lot. Is it a Feanorian star? For those who don't know the background to this, uh, basically, um, Galadriel and a whole load of them, the Noldor elves, all came across uh, from Valinor to Middle-earth at the same time, um, but not united. It has to be said, um, the, the leader of them uh, was the Noldor at the time was Feanor, who's an astonishing figure. I'm not going to go into the detail of him at the moment. Um, uh, but another branch of that was uh, Galadriel's family, Fingolfin's family and the like. Um, now, when you sort of dig into the um, heraldry and symbolism, then you, you've got this Feanorian star, which is like sort of, I think, eight-pointed star. Um, but there are also similar stars which are used for other members of the Noldor. Now, as I say, the, the Tolkien experts have been debating this for quite some time, um, and she is not, I think, the consensus view there among people who are even more down into that bit of detail than I am, is that this is not necessarily a Feanorian star. Um, this is one of a number of different stars which were worn by the elves of the House of Fingolfin and Noldorin elves generally. So um, no, this isn't, or at least shouldn't be, uh, Galadriel uh, having Feanorian um, sympathies. Um, Cameron uh, with a Game of Thrones question or Song of Ice and Fire question. Assuming John will mount Rhaegal, will he spit fire on living people or only on whites like the show? If so, how will that use of power change him? Um, well, this is, I mean, it's an interesting question because, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm working with the assumption he will be a dragon rider and I'm working on the assumption that the dragon he will ride will be Rhaegal because that is the dragon named after his father and that kind of all works he probably won't be a dragon rider for very long uh, simply because of the limits of the story but um 
will him will he use that to burn people or just whites i mean i think logically if he was uh riding a dragon it would be to be burning whites i don't think that he'd be out there trying to john doesn't want power i don't want it he doesn't want power in in the books as well as on the show so he's not there trying to kill other human beings um he will do what has to has to be done but he's not there trying to get it so i don't think he will burn um living people and i don't i think that him having the power to do that even if he doesn't use it i, I don't i think if anything that will just make him hate this idea of power even more martin s uh tolkien law question how do you think tolkas and aonwe compare as warriors i tend to think tolkas is significantly physically superior and a better individual combatant whereas Anwe would be a better military leader yes so these are characters who if you've just read the lord of the rings um uh, you may not be aware of tolkas is one of the valar Anwe is um uh, manway's herald tolkas is the greater warrior he's the he came in the laughing warrior he he tipped the balance of of the war against morgoth he is the greater warrior uh there is no doubt in my mind about that that doesn't mean that alan way is not powerful in and of his own right but they're they're different levels um and a question from ak channel tv alicia kingston uh good to see you uh, uh check out the channel uh great uh, content i assume uh, uh that you're covering uh house of the dragon um but uh do let people in the chat know um long time i see robert can't stay but i just wanted to say hi to the chat and your great mods by the way love your haircut oh, thank you uh here's to all the rest of it absolutely uh well thank you very much that's very kind and great to see you um uh let's go to a question from uh from chase saying as a person who's only read the hobbit and the main trilogy will the amazon lord of the rings show be super confusing should i be reading something before it comes out or is it completely off from the books anyway thank you for the positivity you bring to the fandom well thank you um th this is a, an interesting question because i think when i've been asked this uh, before about a year or so ago what should I read before The Rings of Power came out? And I th I think I probably gave an answer, something along the lines of um, then you should probably try reading some, some of the bits of um, the Unfinished Tales relating to Numenor and maybe you want to try the Silmarillion. Um, I think now I'm, I, I know enough about this show to say, I don't think you need to read anything beforehand. Um, I think that uh, they will show us what they need to show. They are not expecting people uh, to know all of the detail of the Second Age of Middle Earth, what that means, where this has come from, what's going on. The vast majority, they, they are... <sighs> They are making the most expensive TV show of all time, and they have got huge ambitions here. There's no doubt about this whatsoever. They, whether it is or not, isn't another matter, but they are aiming for this to be the biggest TV show in the world. They are expecting, therefore, the vast majority of people watching this not to be Tolkien super geeks. So they, we will be introduced to this world and these characters in, in a... I, I assume an, an easy way. We will be introduced, I think, a lot to Galadriel as a character that we know just, hey, this is Galadriel when she was a lot younger. Um, and we will definitely have some sort of flashbacks or prologue or something which sets the scene for um, what we're about to see in the Second Age. So I think my answer now is you don't need to have read anything in order to understand what's going on if you want to then the appendices to the lord of the rings they they are very concise particularly when it comes to like the second age stuff um and there are a lot of names you won't, might not know or recognize but there are some excellent bits if you go if you 
get the Book of Unfinished Tales, there's a section in the Second Age, which has got a description of Numenor. It's got a, a story of Numenor, the man, Mariner's wife. Uh, it's got a list of all the kings of Numenor, and it's got uh, a, an essay about um, Galadriel and Celeborn in the Second Age and Third Age. So that gives you, if you want a little bit of extra information about Numenor, which most of most of casual Tolkien fans are probably not as aware of, and that's probably a good place to go. And the Silmarillion, it's first-time readers often find it quite hard work, so if you do, do not worry. Um, uh, it, second reading, it becomes a masterpiece. Uh, but uh, it's well worth reading as, as a, an understanding of Tolkien's world as a whole. Um, Adam Stakalek saying, will the Rings of Power likely cover more of dwarf culture like food, tradition, religion, etc.? Yes, uh, we've been told that the showrunners have told us that it will. Um, certainly what we've got is Kaza's Casa Doom approaching its golden age. It is uh, this is dwarf culture. We will be seeing dwarf culture, not just um, what we have in the Hobbit. In particular, is is an exiled people, people without a home, and dwarves are very the 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 mountain, the ground uh, where they're mining. That is a part of who they are. Um, so to have them dispossessed was horrendous for them. But here they should be living at harmony with, uh, with the world that's around them, with the rock, with the minerals. Um, so we should see that. We should definitely, I th we've been told we're going to see more of their um, religion or, or spiritual practices as well. Um, one thing I will say at that London event I went to, the showrunners did specifically say um, that we will get to, that they will give dwarfs more um, uh, a, a better treatment than they've have in the, have been given in the past. This was something that I and several others there had as a concern that that dwarfs often, particularly in the Peter Jackson films, they're used for comic relief. They're they're there doing the burping. They're there they're having short height jokes about them. Um, uh, there's jokes about how they eat. Um, this is um, this is a disservice to a great culture, and they reassured us. We'll have to wait and see, but they reassured us there at that event that they were going to be doing justice to dwarven culture. So fingers crossed on that one. Um, let's go to a um, question from Johnny Targs. Good day to you, Robert, and your moderators. Everyone keep up the great work. Shout out to the moderators. Shout out to the moderators. My question pertaining to House of the Dragon. Who do you think was the father of Rhaenyra's children? Her husband, um, Lainor Valarion, um, the sea snake, or Harwin Strong? Um, ab absolutely 99%, I was going to say 100%, never a 100%, but 99% certain this this is Harwin, Breakbone Strong is the father. Um, Lainor was gay. Um, and we read about the fact that they basically never spent any time together. They came to agreement with her that, you know, they they could have other lovers, basically. Um, this was a political marriage. Rhaenyra only went into it, basically, when she was threatened with being taken out of the line of succession. So this wasn't a marriage that either of them particularly wanted, um, and almost certainly... It was never consummated. Uh, so, uh, who are who is the father? Well, they all do look like um, the the Strongs. Um, Harwin Strong is there. The rumours were that they were lovers. There's absolutely no reason to doubt it. So, yeah, ninety nine percent certain of that. Um, Question in the chat, Callie Summers saying, what were Smaug 
and the other dragons doing in the Second Age, um, since it doesn't seem like they got very involved um, of the War of the Last Alliance, since they didn't seem to get very involved. Why was Gandalf worried about Erebor? Okay, so after... Let's roll it back to the end of the First Age for a moment. Uh, we have the War of Roth, which is basically this huge battle from the forces of uh, Valinor taking on uh, Morgoth and his army, and Morgoth got crushed. He himself was defeated, he was captured, he was imprisoned, he was thrown into the void, and his army defeated and scattered. Sauron seems to have at first, whether it was sincere or not, we don't know, he seems to have sort of um, given up to start with, but then changed his mind and disappeared uh, and was not seen from at all for best, basically the first millennium of the Third Age. Some Balrogs escaped. We get the Bal uh, Durin's Bane, who buried himself deep under, underneath Casa Doom. A few orcs were scattered and sort of survived on the edges of the world. And we're told that, and we did get a specific number, it was either three or four, um, flew off and escaped. Some two dragons flew off and escaped and headed to um, the Grey Mountains, basically, the, uh, off to the northeast of Middle-earth. What were they doing during the Second Age? Well, they were just very slowly living. Um, they... Uh, they survived. They were building up their dragon hordes. Um, after the rings of power had been distributed to the dwarf lords, and the TV show will have time compression on this, but there isn't time compression, obviously, in Tolkien's stories. Um, the dwarf lords built up huge amounts of gold, and then the dragons uh, captured them. So um, that's what they were doing. Eventually, Smaug came down and took Erebor. Why was Gandalf worried in the Third Age about uh, Smaug? Because um, he was a loose cannon, and his th the, his thought was that although Smaug wouldn't sort of rally to support Sauron, they were natural allies, and all Smaug had to do was... Uh, sort of come out and just sort of like wreak havoc, havoc across the region, um, be incredibly hard to destroy. And he could, Gandalf, we, we read this, this is one of the things in the Book of Unfinished Tales, actually, there's, there's Gandalf telling his his background story to the quest of Erebor. Um, and he says that, you know, well, what would be there to stop uh, Smaug from going across and burning Lothlorien? or somewhere like that, perhaps even going as far as Rivendell. Um, Sauron wouldn't be commanding him, but they shared uh, aims and ambitions, and, and Sauron would happily let Smaug go off and do all of those things. Um, elves often live in quite foresty places, so a dragon from above breathing fire down would be quite an effective weapon. Um, Gandalf saw two possibilities. He saw that there was a war coming. He saw two possibilities. One was where you have Smaug up there in Erebor, able to go around and cause havoc anywhere. And they would have to pay attention to this, the, the free peoples of Middle-earth. Or if he could get rid of Smaug, then he could get the dwarfs back in there. The people of uh, Lake Town Dale could uh, could flourish, and actually that could turn from being a weak point in somewhere that they could be really worried about to actually somewhere that could stand firm against an advance from Sauron, which is what happened when you actually read the the War of the Ring. What happened in the War of the Ring was that a whole load of orcs did come and attack the Lonely Mountain. And the dwarves and humans who were there withstood them and eventually were victorious. Uh, that would have been a very different story if Smaug had still been there. Um, uh, Tasneem Akbar saying, in terms of the timeline, Rings of Power will be set in the Second Age, but will there be any world building from the First Age? Uh, yes, there will 
Um, we've seen it already. We've seen um, Finrod, uh, Galadriel's brother, um, who dies in the first age. So we see him. Um, we see what appears to be uh, her back there remembering the War of Wrath, some other battles in the in the first age, this whole you have not seen what I have seen. That will be her memories of things which happened a lot earlier. The there's also um a shot of a whole load of elves all holding their swords out and sort of looking as if they're in a circle. That almost certainly was the Sons of Fern, or for those who know their Tolkien lore, the Sons of Fern on taking their oath. So they are going to give us some background on history. Um, so that we can understand what is going on in the Second Age. I I imagine it, and I've not seen it, no idea, but I imagine it being a bit like when you think of the start, the opening of uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, and you get that Galadriel doing the voiceover about the history of the ring and the and the, the rings of power going to everyone um, and what happened with Isildur. That, I imagine... I don't know whether they're going to do it like that, but but that's the kind of thing we're going to get. Um, Cloaked 400k picking up for Bill Riddle. Thank you very much. Are there any other fantasy or sci-fi novels you would like to see adapted to film or TV? Piers Anthony, Dragon Riders of Pern, etc. Yeah, lots, lots. Um, so uh, I was talking about Robin Hobb earlier. I'd love to see the Far uh, series turned into a TV show. Um someone there there are there are some huge franchises i hate the word franchises but you know what i mean uh which have been signed up i think both by netflix i could be wrong narnia is seems to be in development uh purgatory at the moment uh it was bought up three four years ago maybe even more and we've not really heard from it since conan uh, it, it, we need someone to do Conan right um, because it's such an astonishing set of uh, tales. That would be absolutely fantastic. Um, as for other things, uh, just a personal favourite, Raymond E. Feist's Magician series. Love it. I don't think they, they will um, uh, ever adapt that. Um, and... Gene Wolf, Book of the New Sun. It's technically sci-fi, but I I view it as as fantasy. Elric of Mel Melnibony. You'll you'll keep you'll get me going for a long time. <laughs> You're asking me for fantasy that should be uh, adapted. There are, there are so many. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop myself there. That, that's a few. Um, but the ones that Piers Anthony, Dragon Riders of Pern. Yeah, I, I would agree with uh, with both of them. Um, Chris Carter saying the Withered Heath, yeah, that's where a lot of the um, uh, the dragons ended up. Um, uh, okay, so let's go to um, uh, Reflective Rambling saying, still waiting on that book recommendations video. Sometime I will get to do that. The next few months are all about these, these shows coming up, though. Um, Let's go to a question from Diego Godoy saying, Hola, Robert. Hola. Regarding the House of the Dragon trailer, what do you make of this vision? Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, that King Viserys has of sitting his heir on the Iron Throne and all the dragons roared as one. What purpose does he, is it, does he envision for this? Fight the others or something along those lines? So um, I'll read out, um, I copied it down here, what... Viserys says, and we know no context to this at all. This is, and trailers are notoriously tricksy when it comes to context because uh, we don't know that there might be more to this speech. Uh, they might have edited it down. We don't know who he was talking to. Um, he might be quoting someone. Who knows? But this is what it, it, Viserys says in the voiceover to the main trailer The dream, it was clearer than a memory. And I heard the sound of thundering hooves, splintering shields and ringing swords. And I placed my heir upon the Iron Throne, and all the dragons roared as one. Now, on the face of it, that's nothing to do with the, the others. That's nothing to do with existential threats to Westeros. That is, however, Viserys having dreams and prophetic dreams of some 
sense, it would appear. So um, what, what are we to make of this? Well, this is adding an extra element in there. I covered a little bit of this earlier on, so I'm not going to go over the same ground. Uh, but what I would say is this, again, seems to be emphasizing this is a about the Targaryens thinking that they are the ones who have to unite the seven should be inheriting as long as his heir inherits then that's okay and all of this adds an extra layer of poignancy to the story that we're going to be told which is um that they are wanting unity they think this is what is needed and yet they are hurtling towards a civil war which is going to destroy everything and if there is, as rumours go, that some secret that Viserys, you know, whether it's this prophecy or something else that Viserys passes down to Rhaenyra, they both die in the Dance of the Dragons. So even even if Aegon the Second knew about it, then um, uh, then he dies. So it doesn't get passed down. So that knowledge gets lost. So it's like the North remembers. Targaryens, remember? Um, no. <laughs> so um, let's go to question from Zvibo. Um, hi, Robert. It's getting very exciting now with both shows not too far away. Although, to be honest, I'm looking forward to your videos about them almost as much as the shows themselves. Well, thank you very much. For each of House of the Dragon and the Rings of Power, which single thing worries you most about the adaptation? And which aspect are you most excited to see on screen? Um, well, so I'll, I'll do them one at a time. So House of the Dragon, not much worries me, I have to say. I think it's looking really good from what we've seen. One thing which uh, I heard recently potentially concerned me was this idea that this could be turned... Um, uh, into a sort of a, an, an overarching sort of label for an anthology series, House of the Dragons. So it's not just about the Dance of the Dragons, but it's about the Targaryens. So they do the Dance of the Dragons, and then they'll go off to another bit, say, Aegon, Aegon's Conquest or something. Um, that I'm fine about. But the, uh, what would accompany that was this idea that perhaps the Dance of the Dragons could be done in three or four seasons. Now, Granted, the amount of book that we have to for this story is quite limited. The, the story itself of the Dance of the Dragons is big. And if we've got one whole season on the build-up to the Dance of the Dragons, I, I can't see how we could do the whole of the Dance of the Dragons justice in just two more seasons. So I'm hoping that was... Um, not what they're actually thinking about. I'm hoping that they are they are wanting to do it full justice, not speed through it um, once they get to the actual um, dance itself. So that's a concern I have. Um, uh, the the thing I'm most excited to see is this link and understanding of the between the Targaryens and the dragons, because we do not have it in A Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones. Now we get a chance to see people who understand dragons. And it looks, from what I've seen from the, the trailers, um, Daemon Targaryen in particular is being set up as this very Valyrian Targaryen. He's there um, being this character who is very in tune with his sort of Valyrian heritage and so his bond with the dragons is something that we should be or his dragon should be something that we should be looking at as an understanding of how does this how does this work so I'm really looking forward to that with the rings of power the thing I've said 
many times before on, on previous live streams, the thing I'm most concerned about is time compression. Not the time compression per se, but it's the knock-on effects of the time compression. And we might not see that so much in season one, to be honest. It's probably going to be season two, three, four, five that we actually see the real implications of this. But um, it can play out in lots of different ways. It can play out in um how how are you going to get the how are you going to show the the slow descent of um people f into being ring wraiths if you have to do all of that in just a few episodes how are you going to show uh the slow uh turn of numenor from the height of its civilization to um wishing to wage war on on valinor in just five seasons that's a process which took millennia uh th this kind of how do you how do you show on a very real level um the difference between humanity the mortality of humans and elves if you don't actually see humans dying of old age on the tv show that kind of thing that concerns me these things I'm sure if it's written well enough, they can work their way around this. They can show this, but it still concerns me because I've not seen it yet. So that's the biggest concern. In terms of what I'm most excited to see on screen, Numenor, Casa Doom, the bits of Middle Earth that we've not seen before. Um, I, I, I just want to be immersed in Middle Earth again. I just want to go wander and explore this amazing world. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to more than anything else. Um, Gabriel Farrell um, saying, like yourself, I'm pretty confident about House of the Dragon being at least good. Um, so uh, how Rings of Power uh, is far more worrying for me. From the crunching of some of the timeline to uh, and lore to rights issues to some mere aspects of the trailers, it's all a bit concerning. I was also incredibly underwhelmed to say the least, by the Wheel of Time series, which was meant to be Amazon's fantasy epic test run, as I understand it. Can you provide me any with any reassurance? Tell me in your soothing voice that everything will be okay, that we will get the Lord of the Rings series we all deserve. Any crumb of hope will do. Well, um, uh, thank you for giving, <laughs> putting the trust in me to, to reassure you. Um, what I can't do is tell you that this is going to be great i've i've not seen enough of this yet i cannot tell you that this is going to be the lord of the rings show that we all long for and deserve i hope it will be i i have it's an overused phrase some sort of cautious optimism here i'm feeling that more and more i'm seeing the things i want to see from this but if you're after positivity what I can say, I am very, very convinced that we will get, that we will love, um, is the look back in time, the 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 vision of the two trees. We saw it in the trailer where the camera pans and we see, it goes up and we see Tyrion, we see Valinor, we see the two trees. Um, we we get sights from the first age. Maybe we'll even get to see Feanor. This is going to be um, this look back into these kinds of things that we um, have have simply never seen on on film before. It, I, I, it should be amazing. I think that the thing that I'm looking forward to visually in the second age, Casa Doom. I, I just cannot wait. From what I've seen of Casa Doom, it looks amazing. And Numenor as well looks absolutely fantastic. The other thing that I am convinced will be awe-inspiring is the music. Everything I've heard about the music so far has been brilliant. Um, it's, it's just completely top-notch. So I can't give you the absolute reassurance on the show as a whole yet. Uh, I have hope. Uh, I am. I have rising hope, um, but there are definitely some things there that I I am convinced will be amazing. I just can't speak for the whole thing yet. Um, so I don't know whether that's the, the exactly the uh, the reassuring words you want, but that's uh, that's where I that's where I get to, and, and when I'm sort of putting my positive hat on. Um, 
Zuckerlock saying, Bonjour, Robert. Bonjour. In the trailer, we see Corliss wearing a heavy arm, wearing heavy armor and fighting. I don't see where this fits in the dance after reading the books. Is it the Stepstones Wars? Corliss is old when the dance begins, so it's not very realistic for me. Any thoughts on that and on other characters they might change from the books? Um, well, yes, yeah, this is almost certainly is from the Stepstones. And this is a thing we have to understand in um, House of the Dragon. Season one is covering a long period of time. Season, so yes, when we get to the dance, Corliss is there. He's in his 70s. He's a, he is a living legend, but he is an old man. But this is from, um, if this is, as I'm pretty sure it is, the, the, uh, one of the battles in the Stepstones, then th when uh, that initial involvement, um, when the crab feeder was killed, uh, when that initial involvement ended, that was the year 108 AC. Now, the dance itself started in the year 129, so we're a good couple of decades earlier. So Corliss, at that point, is in his 50s. So could he still be um, wearing uh, full metal armor and in battle? Yeah, he could. I mean, he's not going to be a young man anymore, but he he is of the age, probably the, as I say, the most legendary character. So that absolutely works for me. I've got no problem with that whatsoever. We know he was there. Um, so yes, that, that's fine. In terms of other changes to other characters, um, the only thing... Well, I think they will definitely, because they need to pad it out is the wrong word, but they expand it out. Uh, we'll see a lot of characters getting more rounded, characters who were quite, um, if not two-dimensional, then there wasn't much by way of sort of character meat on their bones in Fire and Blood. They will get uh, a much more sort of screen time and a much chance, greater chance to develop themselves. One thing just to flag as a difference, if you've read Fire and Blood, that they do seem to have made a change in is the ages or the age gap between us. In the books, uh, when Viserys marries Alicent, she's 18, Rhaenyra is nine. So there's a nine-year age gap. Um, what we've seen of the trailers and the promo materials, they seem much more contemporaries, those two. And I understand why they made that. I mean, it's only a slight tweak in ages. Um, uh, and I understand why they've made that, because that allows the, the, the tension between those two uh, over the season is one of the key points and to have them as sort of contemporaries to start with works or is, is easier I think to portray than uh, for the first couple of episodes say having um, them being in a, a much bigger sort of uh, non-contemporary age gap. Uh, Martin S. saying, was Gil Gallad's, this is a Rings of Power question, was Gil Gallad's spear a gloss of legendary quality and potency equal to or greater than what Narsil was as a sword? They're sort of mentioned in the same um, uh, breath, actually, when Tolkien talks about them. And um, so, yeah, we've got Narsil, which is the legendary sword that Elendil had. That's the sword that... Pardon me, the sword that was broken, the sword that cut the ring from Sauron's finger. And we get uh, Elendil carrying that into battle, and we get um, uh, Gilgalad carrying Eglos, the spear, into battle. We're not given huge amounts of extra information uh, about... I, I will at some point soon, I'm, I'm going to do a video about Narsil... Um, but in terms of sort of the exactly what magical powers they both have, we're not given huge amounts of extra information. Um, but they are definitely both legendary and treated by Tolkien as being sort of on a level. Uh, Carl Away saying, oh, I missed Robert singing. Yeah, that, that was at the beginning. I, I decided to, to get that one out of the way early on. Um... 
Laura Estrada saying, The Rings of Power is a struggle for me, especially the sexualization of Tolkien. I'm far from a prude. It's just so disrespectful to the Tolkien mythos. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know in terms of the Rings of Power and sexualization of it. I'm not sure what you've seen there. I've not seen um, much by way of sexualization in there. Certainly the impression I've got is that they're wanting this to be a family friendly um uh, adaptation so yeah i'm not 100 percent sure of what uh what that is there is um particularly when you go back into like the first and second ages that in in tolkien there is a lot more uh he doesn't sort of focus on it but it there is a lot a lot more sort of hard material tough material uh to be going uh there with um well, if you if you if if you if you hunt back through there, you'll find uh, all all kinds of uh, rape and incest and and uh, not very pleasant stuff. Tolkien doesn't shy away from it; uh, he just doesn't focus the camera on it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know what you what you've seen there. I I personally don't think I've seen too much sexualization in the uh, the promo materials. Uh, Curse Ballerina. Um, in House of the Dragon, George R. R. Martin wants Jaehaerys the Second added back into the Targ line of succession. How, when he hasn't been born yet? Uh, and secondly, does the wall keep Maester Aemon alive? I think, well, in the second one, um, does the wall keep Maester Aemon alive? I don't think that's one of the wall's special abilities. Um, I think he's just very old. Um, uh, the, as to the first one, I'm going to link this to a question from one of my patrons. This is from Glenn Thrasher saying, I read or heard somewhere that George has three demands for House of the Dragons. Number one, colourful dragons. Number two, colourful heraldry. And number three, a reference and or mention of Jaehaerys the second. The first two demands make sense and should not be hard to do. But if this George R. Martin demand is a real thing, how do you think the writers can shoehorn Jaehaerys the second into a story set uh, when it, he was 130 years after the dance. Um, so, yeah, this is this is a thing. I, I wasn't sure about this, but I have uh, checked through. And this was an interview one of the showrunners did with, and I forget which, reputable magazine. And the showrunners said that George R. Martin had three things that he was particularly keen on, one of which was that the Dragons should be colourful. Uh, one of his critiques of Game of Thrones, it sounds like a minor critique, was that although when they were young, the dragons clearly had different colours. As they got older, um, they sort of turned generic, sort of dark dragonish colour. He wants the dragons in House of the Dragon to be very clearly, distinctly different, uh, particularly in their colours. Second, uh, the he wants the um heraldry to be bright and bold and obvious this is an important point for him as being this is you know the how all the different sides show who they are who you can tell who is who on a battlefield uh, or an attorney um so that kind of makes sense and the third one is this comment about Jaehaerys the second now yeah Jaehaerys the second for those who don't know is uh, Eris the second, the Mad King's father. Now, what see, this seems to be about is not that he is going to be included in House of the Dragon, um, uh, in terms of the Dance of the Dragons. So then, we're not going to suddenly get like some uh, shoot forward in time where we see Jaehaerys the second sat on the throne and going, "Ha! Huh, so that's what happened all that time ago." When that's not what this is about this is one of those things that and I, I mentioned this briefly earlier in the stream the further we've got away from game of thrones the more open george R. R. martin has been about um the niggles um, that he had with game of thrones the tv show um one of these that apparently seems to have annoyed and some things have annoyed him um, at quite a deep level, as in more than you would think that they might necessarily 
uh, do, but there probably were reasons for this. One of the things that seems to have really hit home with him was that in Game of Thrones, the character of Jaehaerys II was not included in the official timelines and lists of kings. And he simply did not understand this, it would appear. He, he said, well, why? It doesn't make any difference whether, whether he's there. So why can't you include this character? He's a character that I wrote about. He's a character I created. You're just taking him out for no reason. Um, and so this seems to really upset him. And so this is something that when he's talking to the showrunners for House of the Dragon, he's saying, OK, well, when as part of this package, you're doing a timeline of kings, make sure your Harris the Second's in there. There are two things here, two points that we can draw out from this, I think. Uh, the first one is um, that this is George R. R. Martin trying to draw this back closer to the books. So the TV show went away from the books. He's now wanting this to come back towards the books uh, by as close as is possible, making sure that the canons... Um, agree with one another as we've said they can't 100 agree because no adaptation is ever 100 uh, exactly the same as the original but as close as they can they should agree with one another that's the that's the first thing the second thing is this does um play into this idea that the showrunners have also sort of hinted at that we're we're not just seeing a show about um the Dance of the Dragons. We're seeing the first of a potentially very long-running anthology show with the badge of House of the Dragon that covers the big moments in the Tar Targaryen's time in Westeros. Now, what we could imagine seeing, if we sort of speculate wildly about what this means, is that we have a few years of the Dance of the Dragons. When that finishes, they look around and go, well, what are we going to do next? Maybe they'll go off and give us two or three seasons of Aegon's Invasion. Maybe by that point he's written Fire and Blood Part 2 and they skip all the way forward to the Blackfire Rebellions. Then they want to do something to do with, I don't know, Robert's Rebellion. He wants this whole universe to be in line with his book universe. He doesn't want it to be completely different in the way that the last few seasons of Game of Thrones he is increasingly emphasising will be increasingly different to how the books end. So those are the, the key points I see uh, coming out from that. Uh, where am I at in the chat? I'm sure I had some more questions in the chat. Let's see where I can find them. Yeah, so username redacted saying which Fire and Blood source will House of the Dragon use to fill lore gaps with? Um, they're not specifically using a source. They are some will be completely new th answers to these questions. Some they may well go with one. Some they may well go with another. Um, question from Sam Klontz the second saying good day Robert uh, more of a fire and blood question what parallels would you draw from the clubfoot and Varys do you think we can glean anything about Varys's arc from the clubfoot's arc thank you so the clubfoot is um Laris Strong he is the master of whisperers and he serves a number of different masters over time and we're never 100% certain about exactly where his loyalties lie um and he knows all of the back routes in and out of King's Landing and the Red Keep. Um, so there are clear similarities with Varys. Uh, where it's, it certainly seems in the books that his story arc goes is that he ends up being part of this group of people who realise that actually this civil war is just destroying the whole continent everybody is losing and they then get together to figure out how do we stop this war because there are people out there who will want to carry on this war how do we actively stop this war and uh they do that through a number of different mechanisms 
they are almost certainly behind the death of uh, Aegon the Second. They are almost certainly behind sending out uh, letters uh, to the lords of the the land who had previously been in rebellion, saying, "If you quickly uh, uh, surrender now and swear fealty, then hopefully that will be enough." Um, they basically force the land into peace. So, the in my book, these guys. They're not always heroic all the way through this, but the fact that they recognize this is heroic in and, in and of itself. Uh, so that seems to be where he ends up going. That doesn't seem to be where Varys's arc is going. Varys has picked his horse. He's picked the king that he wants. He thinks that um, if he gets the right king in place, then actually that can be um, good and that can they can rule well and the 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 land and the small folk can benefit now whereas that has a nobility in and of itself um it does mean that varus actually is just one player among many who just wants their person on the throne which is a different route to where laris the clubfoot strong seems to be going Um, that's, I think we caught up in the chat for the moment. Let's go to a question from 444 saying Tolkien, uh, Martin and Sapkowski are masters of dialogue. Sapkowski, at least in Polish, not sure about the English translation. Um, and I must admit that I'm a bit worried about dialogues in Lord of the Rings, uh, uh, The Rings of Power and House of the Dragon as we are sure writers must have invented a lot of the original lines. In Game of Thrones and The Witcher, when dialogues were taken from, or at least based on books, they were stronger, and those um, invented by writers were usually forgettable. But I must admit that Rhaenys' line about Torch and Realm from the trailer is a pretty strong one. Um, well, yeah, I, I agree when... Um, certainly in Game of Thrones, when they could use George R. R. Martin's lines of dialogue it worked really well and when they didn't then you could often tell um when it comes i it isn't necessarily the case that dialogue is forgettable if it's uh, produced by um uh, a modern writer rather than the the sort of the, the original writer uh, philip boyens uh in for the lord of the rings trilogy uh, on the Peter Jackson films, she came out with a whole load of uh, uh, extra lines of dialogue that just work perfectly there, that fit well. So if you've got a good writer, then it can definitely work. Um, as for House of the Dragon, what we've seen so far sounds good. I have... Um, uh, I've heard it on good good authority that the scripts are on point and they are really well written and George R. R. Martin was really happy, happy with them. So I think that I'm not that concerned about um, House of the Dragon. We'll have to wait and see, but I'm not that concerned. Um, in terms of Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, um, when I was at that London event, one of the other things that they talked about a lot, the showrunners, was uh, language. And they did talk about how the different races uh, had different ways of speaking, and they tried very much to focus in on um, the, the way that Tolkien used language for each of the different races. They were very... Um, they talked a lot about wanting to make sure that um, they didn't use words that Tolkien never used. So uh, they wouldn't, if a line of dialogue included a word that they could, they couldn't find Tolkien ever used anywhere, then they would use a different word just so it always felt like Tolkien, um, which is an eye for detail that I appreciate. Um, one of the, the lines you, you, you talked from the house of the dragon trailer about a line, which impressed you one line, which, uh, impressed me um and uh i forget who it was it might have been digital Tolkien project who picked up on this in the rings of power trailer the um the opening lines from one of those trailers 
where uh, Galadriel and Gil Galad are speaking is iambic in the way that they've they've done this with a kind of a slant rhyme on it. Um, uh, we thought the war at last was ended. Today our days of peace begin. We thought our joys would be unending. We thought our light would never dim. That's that's actually quite well constructed language. I mean, it's not uh, perhaps the, you know wondrously Tolkien language, but it shows that there's an understanding there of of poetry forms and the the high elves speak with a rhythm um which is great da 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 da, -da. for those for iambic is is when you get the the emphasis is is on alternate beats effectively so we thought the war at last was ended today our days of peace begin we thought our joys would be unending so that that is the um uh, the sort of the the structure and the rhythm of it and and again a kind of a slanting rhyme at the end where it's not an exact rhyme but the perhaps the penultimate syllable rhymes or the sound uh, is similar so th there there has been work done I, I haven't seen enough dialogue yet to be able to tell you whether this is true across the piece but that was an encouraging little thing that that um uh was picked up from the trailer uh, Catherine Furseth saying, Hi Robert, getting excited about the imminent arrival of House of the Dragon. My question regards the clips we have now seen of Viserys and what they might show us about his relationship with Beleriand. Yeah, I was saying I was really looking forward to this idea about the links between uh, Targaryens and dragons. He bonded with him and rode him until Beleriand died of old age and never bonded with another dragon. Did Viserys have dragon dreams? Did he have a special understanding of and relationship with old Valeria through his bonding with Beleriand? What does this all imply, in your opinion, about the nature of dragon bonding? Thank you. So I, I love this thought because you say, does uh, does Viserys have dragon dreams? He, he seems to, from what we've heard from the trailers, that he's talking about his dream. Now, this idea that he... Uh, so he did ride Beleriand, the Black Dread. Beleriand died, um, and then he never took another dragon. And the implication in foreign blood was that he, um, although Paddy Considine is, is quite a svelte person, uh, in the books, Viserys piles on the weight, um, and he seems quite a passive character. And so the implication is that he just... He never really got around. He didn't really fancy the idea of um, getting out and about and flying around on the dragon anymore. He just couldn't be bothered. Um, but here we have this added possibility, as you say, if the bond between a dragon rider and a dragon allows some kind of mental communication and understanding of the past, it certainly seems to include some understanding of, of uh, at least one way of the present, in Fire and Blood, we get uh, the dragons of the two different sides of the greens and the blacks before it was war, but they, when they happened to be next to each other, the two sets of dragons were snarl and spit at each other. And that is clearly showing that they understood to some extent the, um, the animosity between their owners. Does that bond extend even further? Does it go the other way? It's a fascinating thought. And Beleriand is the only dragon that uh, existed uh, all the way back to uh, old Valyria, who then made it all the way across into mainland um, Westeros. So, yeah, that I love that thought, uh, Catherine. Um, thank you for sharing that one. Um, James Horner. Um, hi, Robert. As you have previously mentioned, with House of the Dragon being based on such a short story, they're going to have to pad the story out. What minor characters, if any, do you think will be expanded on? Personally, I'm hoping to see more of Roderick Dustin and his Winter Wolves later on. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, I, th I think what we're, um, what we're looking at is... Uh, as I say, padding out isn't the way I would I would say it, but they they a lot of the characters who only get a few mentions will get a lot more screen time. So 
the the delivery style of House of the Dragon is such that you can say, um, and I'm not quoting direct here by any means, but um, Damon had a lover called Miseria, uh, and she fell pregnant, and he went and tried to get her a dragon egg, but Viserys prevented him, uh, and uh, he sent her off to um, uh, the to Essos, um, but she lost her child. Now, that doesn't take long to read, um, but in terms of screen time, if you wanted to show any of those individual elements, this takes up a long period of time, and that allows you to build up the character of Miseria, and I think that will happen. I think Miseria is going to be one of the uh, one of the most intriguing characters we're going to get in this. Um, so I think that's what we're going to see happening, is a lot of characters who um, they might not they might not get mentioned all that much, but they are clearly there and around and the things are going on. Larry Strong, the club foot we we're talking about just a moment ago, is another example. We don't hear huge amounts about him, but he's clearly there and he's clearly very important. So his character will be increased. Even characters like, I think, Kristen Cole, um, we just get told what he was doing a lot of the time and then some speculation about uh his allegiances and things we will actually see him we'll hear him talk we'll actually get to see the character so that it will his character will become more rounded and even someone like alicent i think i mean the uh the actress who plays alicent has basically hinted that she thinks that this character is not just the bad guy there's another side to this story which will be interesting because it's hard reading Fire and Blood to read that and think that um, Alison truly believed that she should, you know, that her son was the right person and that, that they were in the right. Uh, the, the Green Council does come across as being a bunch of usurpers who had been told what the King's resolve was on the matter and decided that they knew better. Um, if there's another side to that story, that will add another layer to uh, Alicent's story and character. Lauren Mintz saying, hello, Robert. My question is about your personal allegiances in The Dance of the Dragons. After reading about it in The World of Ice and Fire and in more detail in Fire and Blood, we've seen good and bad, lots of bad on both sides. Knowing everything, who would you side with? Rhaenyra, Aegon, or someone else entirely? Who do you think is the best choice to rule over Westeros during this time in its history? Well, um, I mean, I don't, I don't naturally take sides in these kind of things. I think I've said before, I'm much closer to being Team Maester than I am in any kind of other uh, team in this. Um, I, I love this. Uh, if, if I had to pick who is probably the best person to uh, to rule, probably would be someone like Corlys Velaryon. To be honest, he's um, he doesn't, he's never really in contention to be the ruler, and his main aim at the end of it all just seems to be to try and stop the war and to bring some sort of peace. And, um, and he's loyal to his family um, and cares about them, but also doesn't seem to be the most war hungry of people. So uh, he seems like a, a reasonable shout. Uh, Rhaenyra starts off in Fire and Blood, at least very positively, but descends quite quickly um uh Aegon definitely doesn't seem like uh, a good character to be uh, to be leading he seems maybe one notch above Joffrey but not much more uh so uh, none of these characters come out particularly well and I think that this is ultimately the thing George R. Martin's wanted to show us everybody loses because of this Andrew Kay saying House of the Dragon has an actual team of writers it seems including some female writers uh, Dan and Dave took, kept too many experts and outside opinions, but very much to their detriment. Uh, yeah, so there is a there's a full writing team uh, involved in this, uh, which sometimes works well, sometimes doesn't work well. So I'm, as I say, I've heard good things about the script. Um, I'm willing to give this uh, a best, uh, a good go, and I think that this has got a good chance. Um, 
Dan McKay, did many of the writers or crew working on House of the Dragon also work on the Game of Thrones TV show, or is it a totally fresh bunch? Are there any actors from Game of Thrones with roles in House of the Dragon, like maybe playing an ancestor or something? Well, okay, this uh, this is probably worth uh, clarifying, because I, I have heard still some people saying, oh, after what happened with Game of Thrones season eight, I don't really want to try this. Um this is completely new. So the old showrunners are not involved at all. They've got absolutely no involvement in this at all. Um, you asked about actors. No, there's no crossover of actors between the two shows. In terms of showrunners, the two showrunners are Ryan Congle and Miguel Sapochnik. Ryan Congle is a, a nerd about George R. R. Martin's world and... Um, George R. R. Martin basically handpicked him. Miguel Sapochnik was a director in Game of Thrones. He directed some of the, so for the Battle of the Bastards, some of the big action um, episodes he did, and he did a good job of that. So um, he wasn't involved in writing. He was just there doing the directing. Um, other names that have crossed over uh, Ramin Jawadi is still doing the music. I take that as a win. I thought the music for Game of Thrones was excellent. David J. Peterson is still there as language consultant. He's the guy who came up with Dothraki and Valyrian and things like that. Him still being involved, again, I take as a good thing. But almost everyone else seems to be completely new and different. Now, uh, that I think includes behind the scenes people as well. They've moved, they're no, they're no longer based, they were in Northern Ireland for Game of Thrones. They've moved, they're now just outside London. So it's it's a different set of uh, people behind it. I'm sure some people have come across, but this is a, the, the message is this is a new set of people with just one or two, the music, the language, uh, just for some continuity. Um, Dan McKay um, asking about Rings of Power. If we see any Astari in the third age, in the second age, I suppose they will be very afraid of Sauron. Uh, why would they be afraid? Do you think? Aren't the Maya at comparable levels of power? I don't see how an Astari could be hurt. So what is there to be afraid of? Um, perhaps maybe they will have forgotten less of their pre ardor existence in the second age as compared to the third. So um, in terms of the Astari, the, uh, I think the Blue Wizards should be there. Um, they might not appear in season one, but I think they should be there. Uh, the, the other three Astari, Saruman, Gandalf, and Radagast, I don't think should show up. Um, uh, are all of them of the same level of power well no because we saw that in the third age that there was saruman was the head of his order uh greater power than say radagast uh so that they're, they're not of the same uh, and sauron was pretty mighty so yes they would have a reason to fear him but the um maya who went to middle earth seem to pardon me seem to have um lost uh, i talked about this in a couple of recent videos actually they seem to have not got much by way of memories of their previous life back in uh Valinor. kelly johnson will Kristen cole put damon in his place he will certainly defeat him or he, in the books he did and i'm pretty sure they'll stick with this on the show he will defeat him um in a tourney quite uh, comfortably. Uh, Reflective Rambling, thank you picking up a question for Callie Summers. Char what are the chances of House of the Dragon expanding on Baylor so she can get her dues as a fantastic character? Um, we've not really seen this, so there's there's a few characters in the wider um, the wider Targaryen family tree that we've not really seen much of in season one. Um, which I kind of understand in terms of the promo materials and stuff, which I kind of understand. They have um, cast Baylor. She's a, a great character. This is the daughter of um, uh, Damon and Lena. Uh, so the, I understand why they've kept this 
as close as they can because there are a lot of Targaryens slash Velaryons um, and for the new casual viewer uh, if they can if there are some that don't play much of a role in the first in the events of the first season then they will happily keep them out uh, so Deeron for example um, seems likely not to really feature at all he's he's down in Old Town um, being a, a squire down there so there's no real need to feature him so some of the characters and they will introduce a few more uh, and for example uh, she definitely will be introduced because she will be important later on but they will introduce a few more I am sure as characters die which um, not too much of a spoiler alert given it's George R. R. Martin and a civil war Targaryens will die uh, quite quickly um kelly johnson saying will john and val knock boots in his spin-off um well i don't know what's going on with the spin-off uh it's not been green lit yet this is the john so snow spin-off um my working assumption is that it's a spin-off from the tv show rather than the spin-off from the books because the books obviously haven't been finished and Val didn't appear in the TV show, so I think the short answer is no. Um, Julia Kendall uh, saying, good afternoon, new patron here. Welcome. Um, and I should probably say, uh, I thanked my patrons earlier. If if you want to support this channel, the best way to support this channel is through Patreon. There is a link down in the description, or if you're watching live, I'm sure one of the moderators will put a link wherever the live chat is. Um, but welcome, Julia, uh, and thank you. Saying, new patron here, I have really enjoyed your channel. My question is, with the HBO Max slash Discovery merger, specifically with execs stating that HBO Max is male-focused, do you think that that will affect future seasons of House of the Dragon, specifically making some possible strong women storylines less a focus? And do you think, uh, since HBO Max has been pulling almost uh, or already completed films and HBO originals off the service, this could affect House of the Dragon even in the first season? Okay, so this was something last I was asked about this last week um, and uh, didn't have much. Uh, information to give you to be honest and the reason being that um hbo max isn't it's not a thing in the uk um they've in in the uk and a few other countries uh, hbo signed agreements with um, channels networks uh here uh, to show their programs and in the uk that's sky atlantic uh, and their contract runs for another couple of years so uh, HBO uh, Max hadn't appeared here. So this wasn't a thing. Uh, but I did have a quick check after the live stream. I did go and check just to see what was going on because I know there is a lot of interest in this. Um, this is basically a merger between uh, Discovery and HBO Max, which are two different streaming services, and they're being merged. Now, uh, I, what I will do is I will read the the official statement from a guy called Gunnar Wiedenfels, who I've not come across. And I should say, I'm not an industry insider in the slightest. I'm just reading you what they've got and giving you my own take on it. Um, uh, this is what uh, they said. The combination could not make more sense than what we're doing here. We have HBO Max with a more premium male skewing positioning, and then you've got the female positioning on the Discovery side. You've got the daily engagement that people enjoy with Discovery content versus sort of the event-driven nature of the HBO Max content. Take that together. I have no doubt that we will be creating one of the most complete sort of four-quadrant old young male-female products out there, and I'm really excited about that. I can't wait to see the first combined direct-to-consumer metrics because, in theory, the acquisition power of HBO Max combined with the retention power of the Discovery content I think is going to make for a blowout DTC product, and that should certainly drive very healthy revenue growth for years to come. So this is a business decision, uh, as given away by the last line. But I think the my understanding of this is that uh, where 
if they're talking about who's watching and what sort of watching is happening. HBO Max, HBO generally um, has what they say is a male skewed audience and it is event TV. People will uh, watch, they hope, House of the Dragon every week. Uh, they will come in and watch, and HBO obviously got a history of this, of producing The Wire and uh, West Wing, whatever. It's lo lots of these different TV shows, one after the other, event TV that people come in and watch because it's high quality drama. Discovery is more um, uh, female audience, and it's not like everyone's coming in to watch this one thing. It's a lot, a lot more uh, sort of steady. Uh, it's a lot of people watching stuff every day, and they see this as just matching up two different sides of the equation for them. So that that means if what they're saying there is is the truth so this is their public statement so you know who knows what what else is going on uh but that means that they're not actually looking to change either they're looking to in terms of the actual products so i don't think they're the implication of any of what i've just read is that this will impact on the content of what happens in hbo shows like house of the dragon house of the dragon is definitively being set as the successor show to Game of Thrones. So they are wanting to do things that people um, uh, will tune in for because they loved Game of Thrones and they will also love House of the Dragon. That's the idea. So no, I can't see that they're, they're not saying, okay, our new company blueprint is that everything has to be like this. They're saying, we've got this thing, this lot of stuff, HBO, this is good for that. Discovery is good for that. We want both of them in under one streaming banner. So that, I think, is what it's um, it's doing. There may be more to it than that. I've, uh, as I say, it's not something that is immediately affecting us the, here in in the UK. Um, but I'm sure there are people in the chat who have uh, more knowledge of that kind of thing than me. Uh, I've got two more questions from my patrons. Um, which are now slightly more off topic from the, the TV shows. So if you've got any more questions in the chat, uh, now is the time to drop them in um, and I will try to get through as many of them as I can. Tom Klitoff saying, good evening, Robert, slightly off topic, but could Jamie know about Jon Snow's true parentage or at least have the pieces of the puzzle but not put them together? Um, have a great stream. We'll listen tomorrow while at work. Well, hi, I hope you're getting your work done well. Um, the Could Jamie have put the pieces together? Well, in as much as anyone could, theoretically, he was there for the early argument between Robert Baratheon and Ned Stark, so he'll have seen Ned head off. He'll have known Ned came back with this bastard child, allegedly. Um, and uh, he will know um, pretty much as much as anyone else does. Could he have put the pieces together and say, but Ned's not the kind of person to, to do that. Hey, I wonder what happened to Liana. Um, uh, it's, it's possible, but he doesn't seem the sort to do that kind of analytical, critical thinking. And frankly after the war although our focus is on what's going on with ned and the tower of joy the focus of everyone in king's landing was the fact that the the, of the old king and the old regime has just been swept away uh the new king has come in uh he's people are being um, appointed to things, people are being um, uh, forgiven, other people are being cast out. This is a huge seismic shift. Um, Tywin Lannister's there, uh, sort of showing off of all of his diplomatic muscles. Uh, Jamie is there, he's just killed the last king. This is top of his mind. He's a member of the King's Guard, he's just killed the king. Um, uh, it, what's going to happen with him? What's going to happen with Cersei? Cersei's getting engaged to, to the king. That's his sister lover. What His mind is not on what's going on with, 
with Ned Stark. Ned Stark's come back there. He's made up with Robert Baratheon. That's all he really cares about. So he's got a bastard child. That means that, you know, he's not this paragon of virtue. That's as far as Jamie's thinking will probably have gone on this. Could he have done a bit more? Possibly. What, what this does make me think about is there is a character who every time they cut, they engage with this kind of thing, they do do the critical thinking. And that character is Tyrion. It does make me wonder whether Tyrion's going to do some of the figuring out. Uh, when The question is, when is he going to be presented with this information? Um, perhaps with John, perhaps he will um, uh, come into contact with some of the other people, Bran again, uh, Sam, I don't know. But Tyrion is the person who, given the bits of information, might potentially figure it out. That's what that's what he does. He figures out who hired the assassin, who uh, went after Bran. He figured out who all these people were on the Shy Maid as he was coming down south down the River Rhoyne. That's what he does. He figures stuff out. So if he gets the chance... And maybe George R. R. Martin will never give him the chance. But if he gives gets the chance, he is the person who could theoretically figure it out. Connor Gibbs saying, not directly related to House of the Dragon, but in Game of Thrones, Ned Stark determines that determines that Robert is not the father of Cersei's children through looking at Baratheon heritage. Why does Ned make the conclusion that Jamie is the father and not some other man at court? Incest does not seem like the first thing that would come to mind unless there are never any men around beside the Kingsguard, but wouldn't Ned suspect one of them as well? Um, well, this is this is an interesting question. It's not, I mean, you're not the first person to ask this because Ned does, he does make a leap at the his, his logic. He's, he spends an awful long time in his very plodding way. Love Ned Stark, but he, his brain does work quite slowly sometimes. Um, he ta takes an awful long time sort of putting all of these clues into the right order the seed is strong what about the lineages and the hair color um uh, oh here's a bastard child of robert baratheon looks really like him um oh hang on a moment all three of cersei's children are blonde haired that doesn't quite add up uh, it takes him an awful long time to get around to that little thing it keeps on pushing him and pushing him and pushing eventually he does come to this conclusion and he he confronts um Cersei but it's like yeah uh your your children are not Robert Baratheon's um it, this is incest babies with Jamie and it does seem a little bit well hang on a moment where did that next leap come from because we don't see his brain going through that um so you're not the first to have noticed this I suspect this probably is one of those things that George R. R. Martin probably if he went back and thought about it would have added in a little bit extra there um but in defense of ned's leap of uh logic the incest royalty is not unknown in westeros this is not yes for us this might be a kind of a crazy weird thing to suddenly think but um for incest in royal families yeah, that happens a lot in, in Westeros. So that's not such a crazy thing. It might be new for the, the Lannisters, but even Tywin married his cousin. So uh, yeah, there, there is that. The second thing I think is that Jamie and Cersei's rather weird relationship was well known. Um, everyone knew how close they were. Um, and although not everyone suspected the full extent of it everybody knew that that was a that was a weirdly close relationship um there was also the fair hair um and the looks very very lannistery um and th the other thing we often kind of almost uh, beatify Ned as being this wonderful character. He is a great character, but he did have a blind spot when he came to Lannisters. He really did not like Lannisters, particularly Jamie Lannister. He really, he he thought when he came in uh, during Robert's Rebellion, he discovered Jamie sitting on the Iron Throne, and he thought he was trying to claim the throne for himself. And he just, ever since that moment, he just really had a thing about Jamie Lannister. So he was ready and willing 
to think the worst of Jamie Lannister. And I think when you add all of these things together, you can understand how Ned, I mean, he might not have known, but he might have guessed that that was what was going on. And so, yeah, it's not, I think it's, it's in universe, it's less of a leap than it is for us out of universe. Okay, let's go into the the chat. I had a couple of questions here. Um, Kelly Johnson saying, will Amelia come back if the money is right? This is Amelia Clark. I see you're talking about, and I see you're talking about the Jon Snow show. Um, in, I mean, I hope not her character is dead. Uh, and so, yes, Death isn't always the end of it in in Game of Thrones world, but I, I mean, I'm I'm already in the camp of I will need a lot of convincing that this is going to be a good story. Um, just bringing Daenerys back doesn't that just screams uh, uh, trying to grab grab views and um, no, I don't know. I don't think. Reading interviews with Amelia Clark, I don't think that that's even slightly in her mind. I think that she feels that she she enjoyed her time on Game of Thrones. She appreciates her time on Game of Thrones. Clearly, it has catapulted her into superstardom. But uh, that that's it. She's moved on. She's doing other stuff now. Uh, Kaios Ballerina saying, uh, what do you think about the three types of dragons in House of the Dragon, horse, dog, and wolf? Does this affect the intelligence of the dragons? Will this reflect on their rider's personality? Is this canonical? Um, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't think this is canonical. Uh, I, I think, and I may have to come back to this one next time, because uh, I think that they, there's a reference here that I'm missing somewhere. Um, but the 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 design of the dragons if this is what this is about um uh, should not be the thing about um their intelligence this their, the intelligence and character of the each of them should be very different there are not three different types or races of dragons they they should each be individual and different but i'll come back on the specifics of the horse dog and wolf i've not really heard come across that i'll come back to that next week um, um reflective rambling saying dogs love car rides true uh dragon saddles in house of the dragon uh tinfoil at stark direwolves on a joy ride Craigan mentions alaric convincing ali or silverwing in negotiations um uh, i don't think direwolves are going on a joyride on a dragon no i would love it that would be quite amazing wouldn't it um the as a sort of reverse of this one a thinking point perhaps uh something to ponder uh, daenerys uh, in her vision back in a clash of kings has uh is told that she has three mounts to ride and the sort of the flashing other images seem to be very clearly um, um, amount to bed is her white horse that she rides to uh, bed uh, to on her wedding night with Carl Drogo. Amount to dread is pretty clearly Drogon uh, in my view, uh, and then amount to love. Uh, now, what is that? This is presumably connected with her next love. If if her next love is Jon Snow, as we suspect, what mount might there be? Could this be Ghost? I love the idea. Um, I mean, this is. I think it's not quite tinfoil because it kind of fits some of the facts. But I love the idea of Danny riding Ghost at some point, perhaps with Jon walked into ghost uh, i don't know how that might happen i don't have any context for where that might happen but i love this idea that that might be perhaps a way if she doesn't have a dragon for some point at some point she has to to be riding on the back of ghost uh jack myatt what was the hour of the wolf and how will it be shown the hour of the wolf was at the very end of the dance of the dragons and uh long story short 
towards the beginning of the Dance of the Dragons, we'll probably see this at the beginning of season two rather than the end of season one. But at the beginning of the Dance of the Dragons, um, Team Black, um, that's Rhaenyra and co, decide they want to try and uh, call in some extra support from around uh, the, the lords of Westeros. And so send son Jace goes up to Winterfell and gets uh, the Starks to agree to join up to their side and join in the battle. Now, winter has come. This is a, takes a very long time to gather the banners and then march south, but they do. And they head south of Winterwolves. Craig and Stark the, is at their head and they arrive pretty much when it's all finished. Um, and Craig and Stark arrives with a complete army while everybody else has just been battered to the ground, uh, lying, panting, uh, with, with cuts everywhere, uh, figuratively and in many ways, literally. Uh, and he just arrives there and bosses the whole thing. He basically says, right, OK, I'm in charge. I will figure out what's happening now. Uh, oh, the, the king just got killed. OK, he's responsible for that. Right, I'm going to kill you and you. These people there, they can go up to the wall. Um, right, I now want to, who, who's still in rebellion, I'm going to go off and attack them. And he basically, he just, for, the, for a, a short period of time at the end of the war, nobody can stand against him because um, uh, he is the only one with an army left. And he comes down and is in complete charge. And that is the hour of the wolf when uh, the, the Starks, who for so long had basically stayed out of um, Westerosi politics, not bothered to venture south at all, come down and for a very short period of time are the most important uh, in, in all of Westeros. How will it be shown? I hope that this is the end point of the show or this bit of the show with the dance of the dragons the hour of the wolf is the proper cutoff point uh and then at the end of it all he just and how it's told in fire and blood basically to says right it's time to go home time to go back to winterfell and he like just says right come on men let's head back and then they just go back and that's it it's just like okay he's he's done his thing he's gone away um so that's that's what it is and i hope that they just show it pretty much as it happens in the book so because it's such a, a great uh it's not seen so much as a set set piece um curse bellamy is saying it's from an article by entertainment Week weekly thank you i will have a look at that and i will get back to you next time um uh, Reflective Rambling saying, you break my heart in Deep Geek. I don't know about what. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure what it was that I, I broke your heart for. Um, oh, help support Robert's new chair fund. Um, I, I don't, have I not given you my chair fund uh, update? Thank you so much. I mean, this is sort of a running joke. Um, I'm sit still sitting in a rubbish chair. But I, I have. Uh, thank you for those people who... who um, gave super chat saying could you put this towards a nice chair i have bought a nice chair it's the other side of the green screen behind me um but what you can't see this setup is really quite close and my green screen i'm literally just touching it there like that and um the 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 nice office chair i bought is the base is too big and i actually can't fit it in between the desk and the green screen so when I'm working, when I'm writing stuff, I've got my nice office chair. Thank you very much, everyone. I hugely appreciate it. Uh, but while I'm doing these live streams, I'm still I'm back in the old rubbishy one. So uh, so that's where we are. Um, thank you, uh, thank you very much for all of that. And uh, apologies, I thought I'd uh, I thought I'd said that um, before. Uh, James T. Kirk saying uh, Aragorn or Jamie one v one. Well, certainly Jamie with one hand, Aragorn would uh, wipe the floor with him um i think aragorn's still eating when jamie's jamie was a very good fighter but he wasn't the best in westeros aragorn's something else uh uh frankly vandering saying no i just copied or pasted the wrong link oh okay um uh let's have a quick flick through um the Tolkus 42 oh saying hour of the wolf after party was a marriage mixer yeah absolutely so basically the the 
the army that came down, these were people who uh, were leaving the north in winter, not expecting to return. And there wouldn't be basically room for them to return in winter. There wasn't enough food to go around. So they had to do something. Some of them headed off uh, over to Essos um, and became uh, uh, swords. Uh, quite a lot of them, though, uh, they basically had these marriage fairs where all of these new widows in the Riverlands, whose husbands had died in the war, uh, they got a chance to sort of go on some speed dates with these Northerners. And if they met them that they liked, then they settled down and the Northerners moved into the Riverlands. So there is, um, in the Riverlands, there will be a, quite a lot of mixed first men blood, I'm sure. Um, let's just having a quick flick through. Um, yeah, Derry's uh, read it before. You're saying exactly the same as what I just said about the significant portion of the Northern Army scatter um, and uh, marry. Um, let's have a quick... Username Jack is saying, did Damon declaring himself King of the Stepstones set the precedent that led to the War of the Nine Penny Kings? Uh, well, various people had called themselves King of the Stepstones before, so it's not really a not really a precedent. Um, but the um, so the Nine Penny Kings were these nine people uh, over in I call them people, but you know the, the wannabe kings over in Essos who came together and said, "Okay, well, why don't we? We've all got different things we want to be." Um, one of them was the last Blackfire um, and uh, Blackfire Pretender, and why don't we just say, well, we'll go all, we'll between us, we'll get achieve all of these nine ambitions and support each other in it, and that's that. And they were heading over the Stepstones, and this is where the War of the Nine Penny Kings comes because um, uh, technically it was the last Blackfire Rebellion, um, uh, but uh, yeah, actually Duncan. So Duncan, I think, was involved in, in that one. Andrew Case saying, interesting to see Rainis seems to be more edgy and political in House of the Dragon than the impression I got in the text. Look forward to seeing that uh, portrayal. Yeah, she does. Uh, I mean, I think she was in the text. She always was, and she was sort of not written out of the action, but she was no longer the prime person but she was the queen who never was she was absolutely she she was still holding on to this uh sense of wrong done to her uh so yeah i quite like what i've seen so far of Rainis uh, from the trailers and if she is there um basically with this slightly uh hard-nosed um uh They'll, 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 you'll, they'll never allow you to become queen because they never allow a woman to become queen kind of approach that actually fits my understanding of the character. Uh, Callie Summer saying, Smaug seemed so interested in Bilbo but didn't notice the one ring. The dwarven rings attracted dragons, so why didn't the one? Um, I mean, the, the out of world answer is that when Tolkien wrote The Hobbit, then. Um, he had no thought of this being the One Ring. This was just a magic ring. It was only later that he came up with the idea of the One Ring uh, and all the story that followed on from that. So there will be some some things that don't make huge amount of sense. Um, but uh, Dutch Hulk saying hello, Robert in Deep Geek uh, mods and everybody in the chat. Um, do you think? George R. R. Martin drew inspiration from the Muppet when naming the Tullys. Yes, he, he definitely did. The Kermit, uh, Grover, Tully. Um, he, he's got a very silly sense of humour at times. Uh, and yes, definitely. Um, uh, the heartbreak reflected around being, me being silly at the denial of not <laughs> of a rider behind a dire wolf getting slobbered on at high altitudes by a flapping tongue. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, sorry about that. Maybe, maybe they will do it, and I'm just being a bit of a killjoy. Um, Emma Scheiman saying, is the marriage between Rhaenyra and Daemon a love match or a union for power or both? I mean, I think it's a bit of both. I think it's probably more of a love match on Rhaenyra's side than it is on Daemon's side, personally. 
Um, but uh, that's just my own uh, little take on it. Okay, so uh, we are now only uh, just over a week away from House of the Dragon. Uh, what I'm going to be doing on this channel, I will sort of properly announce it somewhere. I'll probably put something up on Twitter as well. Um, in terms of coverage of House of the Dragon, um, House of the Dragon will be uh, dropping in the old Game of Thrones slot. So 9 p.m. Sunday uh, Eastern time, which is 2 a.m. my time. Feel free to work out what it is on your time uh, on the basis of that. Um, I will be doing a live stream beforehand um, at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time on the Sunday. The breakdown of each episode for the following day uh, within 24 hours of the episode. And then there will be each week uh, a topic, uh, something that came up, so an issue to, to dig into the lore and history on, something like that. And I will also try and do a quick trailer breakdown of the uh, coming up next time trailer so that's what i'm going to be doing on house of the dragon i'm aiming to do something similar also on the rings of power when that's out um uh, these thursday live streams will continue when rings of power is on then these will turn largely into the thursdays will turn into rings of power and sundays will be house of the dragon so that's just giving you a little flavor of what's coming up but we've got one more week before we get into that um, uh, one more Thursday, I will probably do um, uh, another open Q and A. Um, you'll see it uh, there if you sort of like. If you actually, I, I very rarely do this uh, on the live stream, but if you if you know the little bell icon on YouTube, if you if you make sure that that's uh, toggled and clicked for for this channel, then you will get notifications of when uh, my. Uh, videos come up when the live streams are set up. So if you're at all uncertain about when that is, do make sure you've got the, the little bell thing toggled. Okay, that's all for this time. Um, thank you again, everyone, for your wonderful support. Uh, getting to 400,000 leaves me feeling very humbled and, and very happy and grateful for all the support so far. Uh, thank you, moderators. You do a fantastic job. Uh, thank you, patrons, for all of your support. And I will see you all again same time next week. Take care, everyone. Bye.